I'll just mute and make myself invisible here. We're live now, Declan. Um, good morning, members. Thank you. Sorry, Declan, can I, can, I remind, can I remind all members to please mute? Yeah. Because there is actually feedback at the minute. So you need to mute, except for the chair, only on mute when you're asking questions. Hi, Patsy. Okay, members, still a wee live now? Live now. Okay, members, uh, like a welcome you to the weekly meeting of the hearing committee. Uh, we're still on virtual, so we are, by, by a Starleaf, and welcome anyone who's who's watching in this morning as well. Uh, we have a very busy agenda this morning, so we're going to have to keep our, our comments and our, our, our questions fairly focused. Um, um, we're, we're quoted here at the minute, so... Um, Members, uh, if you have any issues with Starleaf, if you can let us know, and uh, you know, mute, mute your microphones until it's time to speak, because there's a, the, that limits the background noise. Um, today's meeting will be an oral evidence session with Mid and East Antrim Council on the security issue at the ports, an oral evidence session with the Shared Environmental Services, a departmental oral uh, evidence session on the horse racing amendment bill. We'll have a closed session briefing towards the end of the meeting um, at the forward work programme to discuss um, the climate change bill. And members, there's a substantial amount of business today and we need to get through it in a timely manner and be finished up for 1pm. Uh, and um, and obviously please to plan to get into account in your questioning. Uh, so we're in open session now. Uh, we'll be recorded uh, throughout Parliament buildings and online. Um, I have no apologies. And in terms of the chairperson's business, um, I want to refer members to the note of the informal meeting with the NIFRS committee on page five and the note of the informal meeting with the OEP at uh, page six, which took place on the 15th of April. Are members okay to note this? Yep. Yep. Okay, the draft minutes uh, uh, from the meeting on the 15th of April. Uh, can I seek agreement for those minutes? Okay. And I'll, I'll sign them whenever I'm back up again on, uh, on Monday. And uh, there are no matters arising. Uh, so, members, uh, item five here now on the agenda. I would we're moving on to an oral evidence session, uh, Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, uh, in relation to the withdrawal of DERA and local authority staff from the ports. I want to refer members to a briefing paper from Mid and East Antrim Borough Council at page twenty, and I want to welcome by Starleaf. Um, Anne Donaghy, the Clerk and Chief Executive, Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, and Peter uh, Johnson, Mayor, um, uh, Mayor of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council. And I'd like to invite the um, Council representatives to brief the committee, and then the committee members will want, will then ask some questions. So you're very welcome this morning, um, Anne and Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, committee. And just before we start, can I check that you can hear and see us okay? We, we, we can hear you, but we just can't see you. Mm. Is, there a, is there a setting for the uh, camera or something, um, Peter? I'm not too sure. We're I've got uh, we've got somebody here from from IT who's just going to have a quick look at this for us. Yeah, um, yeah, you, you're welcome. To, oh, we got you. <laughs> Is that it now? So you can you can yeah. see we're, we're loud and clear. Yeah, we got you. We got you. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, Chair, thank you, and uh, and committee, thank you as well. Um, we we certainly very much welcome this opportunity today to provide a verbal account regarding the circumstances which led to a unanimous cross-party decision to temporarily withdraw our staff from the Port of Larne pending a formal written threat assessment by the PSNI. As Mayor, I am confident that by the end of today's session, the committee will have absolutely no doubt that the course of action taken by Council was the only course of action that should have been taken. The one overriding and consistent theme underpinning this matter from start to finish has been Council's steadfast commitment to prioritising the safety of staff at all times. 
I trust that the committee will have conducted uh, in-depth research and will be aware that Council's requirement for this formal written threat assessment by the PSNI was not only a matter of good governance, but was a regulatory and legal obligation on the part of Council as per the Health and Safety at Work Order of Northern Ireland 1978. Council must also ensure risks to staff have been identified with preventative and protective arrangements put in place as required by the Management of Health and Safety at Work regu Regulations of Northern Ireland 2000. But aside from these obligations, the safety and well-being of all staff are of paramount importance to me as Mayor, to my elected member colleagues across all parties and to our Chief Executive as responsible employers. We have an extremely low threshold for risk when it comes to our staff in all circumstances where their safety is compromised in any way, we believe it prudent as a responsible employer to err on the side of caution, as indeed we did very clearly on this occasion. With this in mind, I find it extremely disappointing that what was and always should be a matter exclusively focused on the safety of 12 young employees, and indeed one which warranted unanimous support across all parties, has shamefully been mistreated manipulated and exploited as political football by certain parties. Despite this, Council stands firm over the actions taken to protect our employees. Given the same circumstances, we would take exactly the same course of action, and that is adopting a safe, not sorry approach. What's more, the same course of action was taken independently by both DERA and the EU Inspectorate, we both stood down their staff at the ports on the 1st of February as well. Further, on the weekend of the 20th and the 21st of March, DERA took measures to protect its staff at Belfast Port that resulted in checks being carried out for a period of uh, around 24 hours. Without consultation, the Department of Communities later closed our port staff offices in Larn on Friday the 9th until Sunday the 11th of April, citing what it described as civil, civil disturbances. These disturbances thankfully did not occur, but the offices remained closed. I would also like to draw the committee's attention to one other salient point. And having reviewed our written evidence in detail, I trust the committee will, like me, have been bitterly disappointed by the very apparent discrepancy and delay in the information being provided by the PSNI. This was noted by Belfast City Council, DERA and our own council. And this point was, be, was to be described by the DERA minister as, in quotes, unacceptable and a matter which made him, again, in quotes, fundamentally unhappy. Furthermore, in his evidence to the committee last Thursday, the temporary Assistant Chief Constable Singleton said that, to his knowledge, there had been no contact between Mid and East Antrim Borough Council and the PSNI between the 21st of January and the 1st of February. Completely contrary to this, however, you'll find in Appendix 13 in Council's written evidence a detailed log of no less than eight engagements between Council and PSNI during this period. I will now hand over to Council's Chief Executive, Ms. Anne Donaghy, OBE, to take us through a high-level summary of what I believe is exceptionally thorough, detailed, and indeed extremely compelling written evidence that I hope the committee has taken time to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, as the Mayor directed, I will now provide for the committee chair a top-line summary of the wealth of information provided in our written evidence. This outlines a significant number of factors which ultimately led to the unanimous cross-party decision by Mid and East Antrim Borough Council to temporarily withdraw our staff from Larne Port pending a formal written threat assessment by the Police Service of Northern Ireland. I will now take each of the factors in turn. Firstly, the appearance of multiple incidents of sinister and threatening graffiti from as early as mid-January. This included messages such as, all border post staff are targets. The Good Friday Agreement is done, time for war. All Irish 
sea border staff are targets. And this message was accompanied by a menacing cross her target symbol. Whilst the first appearance of graffiti was deemed by the PSNI to be an isolated incident, multiple other incidents of threatening graffiti appeared then to contradict this. Understandably, this was a cause of serious concern among our elected members and council officers. But most importantly, however, it was distressing for council port staff since it was clearly visible to them when travelling to and from their place of work. Secondly, in Appendix 2, we have highlighted the heightened media coverage around the threatening graffiti and more widely about the rise in tensions surrounding the border control posts. This only served to heighten concerns among council staff and elected members. Thirdly, at the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on the 27th of January, the PSNI Assistant Chief Constable confirmed growing discontent with the protest within the Protestant Unionist Loyalist community, saying that this could later manifest in protests. Point four, a number of actions taken by DERA also gave concern, including the issuing of a DERA memo to staff urging them to report suspicious activity from the appearance of the graffiti saying, all border post staffs are targets on the 21st of January. At a solace meeting on the 28th of January, DERA advised that the threatening graffiti was of concern to them and their staff. DERA also informed on Monday morning, the 1st of February, that they, to staff that they did not have to travel to work in their own cars if they didn't feel comfortable. Instead, they provided a bus for staff use. Point five, there was increasing information from political representatives, contacts at grassroots and staff that suggested tensions were rising. This included reports that Crime Stoppers had been informed of a number of individuals at the port were being targeted. Reports that a member of the DERA port staff had been followed home from her workplace and that sinister graffiti had subsequently appeared near her home. Reports that a perpetrator had links to organised crime gangs. Point six, there were reports from staff of intimidating behaviour at the ports, including an increase in stationary and slowing vehicles observed at the port and the suspected recording of car pl number plates details. Video footage of cars taken at Larne Port also appeared on social media. The DERA Minister confirmed that he had also been informed of this by staff. With this in mind, and the fact that there is only one way in and one way out of Larne Port, it become increasingly concerning. Point seven, written communication received by Council from a major trade union on Monday the 1st of February outlined concerns for staff safety. The trade union requested that Council revert to update it on mm. how we plan to address, and I quote, potentially very serious threats. Point eight, there were mixed messages and a lack of reassurance from the local PSNI. Information received from Council, all information was reported through to local PSNI. They were often guarded and offered very little reassurance and only added to the uncertainty. Point nine, the increased presence of PSNI at Larne Port created concern with staff and elected members. Since the PSNI obviously deemed there to be a credible enough threat to warrant this, the PSNI later confirmed almost 2,500 standard hours and 391 overtime hours have been dedicated to increased resource plan in the area. Point 10, the discovery that the PSNI had established a gold command structure, despite assuring us as partners that threats were minimal. Furthermore, councils had not been informed or invited to participate in these gold command meetings, despite us being key stakeholders and a critical source of information and connection to local communities. 
Both Hamad met on the 22nd of January after the first incident of the threatening graffiti in Larne. But council were not aware of this structure until the 1st of February and only attended its first meeting on the 2nd of February. Point 11, the unanimous views of the group party leaders on Monday the 1st at a confidential meeting was that a precautionary, safe, not sorry approach should be taken by council. Finally, having discussed and debated all of the information for over 40 minutes in closed council, elected members agreed unanimously with full support across all parties, including Alliance, Sinn Féin, TUV, DUP and UUP, that staff be temporarily withdrawn from Larnport pending a formal written threat assessment by the Police Service of Northern Ireland. At the Gold Command meeting on Tuesday the 2nd of February, the PSNI committed to delivering this formal written threat assessment later that afternoon, saying that it was already in place. This did not happen. However, when raised by the partners at the Gold Command meeting on Wednesday the 3rd of February, the PSNI confirmed that they were still working on it. So in total, Council had to ask for the written assurance on five separate occasions, two of which had to be escalated to the Office of the Chief Constable, as we were keen to return our staff safely to the Port of Larne as soon as possible. I emphasise to this committee that we have an overriding duty of care to our staff and to their health and safety, which is paramount. There will be no compromise under any circumstance. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chief Executive, and uh, just want to thank you again for all the hard work that has gone in uh, to preparing for today. And, and I, I would like to take this opportunity in front of the committee to publicly acknowledge the commitment uh, that uh, the Chief Executive has has given uh, to public service throughout this uh, matter. Members uh, of the committee, uh, there can be no question that the assimilation of this information outlined by the Chief Executive undoubtedly served as very reasonable and very compelling grounds for Mid and East Antrim Borough Council to take the course of action that we did. For that reason, as Mayor, I wholeheartedly stand over the actions taken by Council in the sure knowledge that they were motivated exclusively by the safety and well-being of our staff, our number one priority at all times and on that will always proceed all other considerations. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, that um, comprehensive um, account. Um, I, I like, I, I'm going to move, there's a number of members who here who have indicated they want, they want to ask some questions. I'm going to turn firstly to uh, Philip Fulton Wigan. Uh, Grimogad, uh, Kierlock, thanks very much. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Anne and the Mayor for, for uh, coming before us today and for uh, outlining their position. I mean, we, we are obviously uh, here to look at the decision to have staff uh, withdraw, withdrawn from the ports and cease carrying out checks required under the Ireland Protocol. Uh, and so I thank you for the fulsome report. I mean, there's certainly lots of interesting material contained within it. Prior to the Council decision, though, uh, on the withdrawal of the staff that we're here to discuss, uh, we, we learned from the Permanent Secretary of DERA last week that Mid and East Andrum Council had written previously to the British Cabinet Office outlining that it had concerns about the implementation of the protocol. C can I ask uh, when that letter was sent? Um, thank you for your question, uh, Philip, um, and I'm happy to answer that. So um, the Permanent Secretary, um, I, I did listen in, intently, and the Permanent Secretary uh, uh, mentioned the 1st uh, of uh, of February, and, and I'm assuming that's the, the letter sent on the 3rd. But uh, in, in terms of that letter, I must emphasise to, to you from a point of view of clarification for, for the committee that I, I did write the letter to the Cabinet Office official uh, in my role as a National Senior Representative of, of SOLAS. Um, and that role requires me to engage with a wide, a wide range of stakeholders across the national and, and international 
stage. Solus, um, as you probably will know, Philip, is a group of council chief executives across the four regions of uh, of the UK, and um, I'm the representative for, for Northern Ireland on that national panel. So it is my duty to represent here the chief executives in, in Northern Ireland, as I'm instructed to do so, on a regular basis to update them on applicable and significant challenges that uh, we have in, in the region here in, in uh, Northern Ireland uh, from a local government perspective. So I have to say that that letter is um, nothing to do with uh, with the decision that was made by, by Mid and East Antrim and is outside of, of the inquiry. It is um, not relevant to our decision making and certainly um, you know I'm, I'm happy to, to share with you some of our key concerns that, that if, if that would be helpful. Just, um, just sorry to interrupt you. In terms of the letter uh, I don't accept it, that it's not relevant. So you, the permanent secretary said the letter was written uh, he said he was copied in on it. So he said it was written by Mid and East Andrum or on behalf of Mid and East Andrum. You're now saying that wasn't the case. It was written on behalf of Solus. So can, can I ask, so you signed a letter on behalf of Solus uh, identifying concerns on the, uh, the Ireland Protocol? I, I wrote the letter, yes, and the letter was you, I mean, expressing concerns on the Ireland Protocol, from my view, uh, is political in, in nature. I mean, did you have the agreement of Solace to write this letter, or did you write it on your own behalf? This, this letter was confidential, and in my role, as I have explained, as a Solace, uh, the Solace rep on, um, across the four regions, I wrote this letter. I'm very happy to give you a, a very high level of, of some of the, the key concerns. Um, in relation to staff, we currently have 12 environmental health officers. The Food Standard Agency has said that we need 68 no, Sorry, I, I, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you. I mean, I'm going to get to the other issues. I'd like just to get clarification on the on the letter first of all, because I mean, there there is the contention that, uh, and I will get to this, that the, the the decision to withdraw staff was more to do with politics than than the actual level of staff. So, I mean, I, I find it a bit disconcerting that a senior official, either on behalf of Mid and East Antrim Council or on behalf of other senior officials, is writing letters to the British Cabinet Office explaining or expressing a view that my view is political about its concerns about the Irish Protocol. I mean, I, I think it would be very helpful uh, for this inquiry and this committee that we actually got sight of the letter. I mean, and I would put that request and um, that we get sight of that letter. I'm now, I'm now going to move on. I'm going, I'm going to leave that because I think that in itself is interesting. The, the letter, the letter is, is is not relevant to our decisions. But if you want to request the letter, you can do that through the formal channels, Philip. Okay. Just... Yep, we'll certainly be doing that. Uh, and uh, in terms then of the decision to withdraw staff that was made on Monday, the first of February. So according to the very fulsome report that we have been uh, provided with, there was an awful lot, indeed an increased amount of activity, whether it was phone calls, urgent meetings, requests for meetings, uh, meetings with Solace and Dira over that weekend prior to the Monday and the Saturday, the Sunday and the Monday. So uh, I, I, note, I note in the report that uh, you said you tried to contact the Dira permanent secretary, but you didn't have the correct number. So instead you contacted the minister. Can, can I ask, uh, did you know the minister uh, was going to step down the following day from that conversation? Was it mentioned in your phone call with him at all? Was there any pressure applied on that this issue from the minister to make a quick decision on this matter? Absolutely not, no. Okay, thank you. So, as I say, the, the, the decision was made on the Monday. Uh, Again, the day the minister uh, who was about to hand over his position uh, made a similar decision. So you you'd sought urgent information from the PSNA uh, and there was to be a meeting the following day with the PSNA. Why not uh, wait for the meeting the next day uh, to hear from the... I mean, you, you're, you're quite right. The mayor's quite right. There, there was eight conversations, whether it was phone calls or meetings with the PSNA and the lead up to this. And at every one of those conversations, the PSNA come back and give you their assessment. Uh, and 
you know, I, I'm just wondering why the decision was taken on the day that the minister was going to resign uh, rather than wait until the next day to allow council to again hear a full report from the PSMA. So I'm very happy to answer that, uh, Philip. So uh, first of all, I, I will stress, as has been um, already highlighted in the Mayor's verbal evidence, you know we are an independent uh, council from uh, from Dara, and we didn't find out that Dara had actually um, stood down their staff to after we were in a council meeting when that happened. So we knew nothing about that. We heard on the media, but what I would say to you, uh, Philip, is that we. And, you know, I'm an accounting officer here, and when you're an accounting officer of a public body, you can take no risk with people's lives or their safety. Safety is paramount here. You know, we have a duty under the Health and Safety at Work Act and also the Human Rights Act, Article 2, which is the right to life. We have to make sure that we put in protective measures. And if there is even 1% of a risk that any of our staff, remembering that they're 12 young EHOs that have just had their first professional job, any risk to their life or their threat would, would just mean that we would have to step in. Do you, and think, you, know, that, do you, and do you think the police were prepared to take a risk? I mean, would the police, the police have said at yeah. all, juncture, all junctures that, you know, the, the level of threat consisted of uh, heightened activity on social media and graffiti? And, and I mean, what jumps out at me from the report is that, that either you, uh, the mayor, senior staff within the Mid East Antrim Council didn't believe or trust the PSNA or, or maybe even further thought there was some conspiracy within the PSNA to keep information from you that that staff were at risk. And I, I just can't figure out why that would be the case. So I, I think that's a pretty irrelevant point at this stage, Philip, in, in terms of, ask, of answering the question. You know, my duty as a, an officer here, as an accountant officer, is to protect my, my staff along with the mayor and the councillors. You know, if there was an inquiry um, in terms of um, of someone getting hurt or whatever, that inquiry, a verbal assessment would be of absolutely no suffice to us. You know, every organisation is required to take their own assessment. And that assessment, we had to satisfy ourselves under our legal duty that our staff were safe. And we could only do that when we got a written formal threat assessment from the PSNI. I will point out that that took four days for us to wait on. I had expected to get it in 12 hours or less, but but you can only base on each organisation on their own risk assessment. And I would say to you, Philip, Every day of the week, I would rather sit in, this, in front of this committee than in front of a committee where some of my staff have been hurt or, or worse because we didn't take the right decision. Okay. Anyone, anyone that understands inquiries will know that a formal written threat assessment is the only piece of information you need, especially when we're audited so much. Okay. So a lot can happen in 24 hours. A lot can happen. And, you know, we live in Northern Ireland and things, as you know, can escalate very quickly. So I stand over the decision that we made. I think it was the right one. And I will remind you again that it took four days for that assessment to come in writing. Yeah. I, 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 and I think, I mean, I think... Uh, I'm sorry, if it's okay. Okay, Philip, if you don't mind, um, I, I think I would just like to, to, to add a bit to that, if you, uh, with your permission, because I think what's an, an important to note in all of this is that on the day, uh, on the Monday, we we were presented um, as a group, and, and and let's be clear, this was a was a group decision that further became a cross party. Uh, supported decision and on the day we were presented with lots of information uh, from various stakeholders on that on that day um, we, you know you, you, you'll be well aware there was the the menacing graffiti which is extremely sinister we wouldn't want any member of staff to be looking at that but corroborating that we had um, the the heightened tensions and activity that we had witnessed on on social media and then we had a very uh, concerning letter from the unions. So in terms of, of, of the, de the decision-making process, for me, and I'm, I'm sure you, you can understand and appreciate the position, had we been sitting that day and presented with that information and took a decision to the contrary of what we have done, I think it would be a much more concerning situation. And in fact, I would be, as, as the Chief Executive quite right, rightly said, I would be probably less surprised to be in front of this committee 
having to answer questions as to why we took the risk as an organization to keep our staff in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, I think that's right, and I think the way certain information is presented uh, determines or predetermines an, an outcome, and, and I think uh, people making the decision genuinely made a decision based on the information they were presented. Part of the reason for this inquiry is we now know that information wasn't always accurate. I mean, we had the trade unions before us, and and the, and they said that the information or the letter or email sent to use was embellished and exaggerated. Which was then presented to councillors to make. I mean, we were also aware of of uh, you know media reports of of you know officials stating that the UDA or, or loyalist paramilitaries were beside it. No, all the the information that, that was presented has a lot of it has actually been discredited. Hence, the need for this inquiry about the decision made by. I mean, for example, you, you talked that an assessment from the a verbal assessment from the PSNI isn't satisfactory. But what jumps out from your report is is actually that you know you were putting greater stall on the information that was provided, I presume, verbally from uh, political representatives or the phrase that keeps jumping out from representatives on the ground. I, I mean, Mid East Antrim Council covers two Westminster constituencies, and its two MPs are obviously Sammy Wilson and Ian Paisley. You know, Sammy Wilson has been quoted as saying or calling for guerrilla warfare in opposing the protocol, saying that it has to be destroyed. Ian Paisley has said publicly that the North was screwed over by the implementation of the protocol and it was bound to end in tears. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, were these two of the people who uh, you were taking on assessments from on the ground or uh, representatives from uh, colleagues of these two people who were talking about guerrilla warfare and that the protocol needed to be destroyed, who were in actual fact uh, adding to increased tensions? Or who, who were these political representatives Sorry. that you were hearing on the ground? And why were you prepared to take those verbal assessments uh, that we now know were discredited and that information provided verbally over and above the information and the facts that you were given from the PSNI? Sorry, uh, Philip, and if, if at all possible, um, I just would, would appreciate if I could address, there's a couple of uh, questions you'd mentioned there um, just before the Chief um, comes comes on to answer hers, in that um, you'd mentioned that the, 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 the evidence has been exaggerated on the day or, or, or somehow has been uh, embellished. And, and actually, I personally believe with hindsight, Actually, the evidence that we were presented on the day has has almost vindicated our decision making process because as time has went on, we have now been uh, presented with more and more evidence. Uh, we, we we had a limited number of evidence on the day, but more and more have that has come to light. And and I think that the other thing as well that's that's worth noting for the for the committee too. A lot of this evidence was uh, graph. I mean, you, you've seen some of it earlier on. Th this was this was very visible demonstrations, you know, saying that all all uh, border post staff are targets or all, all port staff are targets. I mean, that's extremely sinister. And, and Philip, you quite rightly, um, you quite rightly condemned, as did I and, and many other, um, uh, in fact, I, I think every political party in Mid and East Antrim condemned the, the, the same graffiti that was put up uh, against uh, one of your colleagues um, in, in Ballymena, which had the same style with the crosshairs. I mean, that's extremely disappointing, and 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 we wouldn't want any member of staff, any p uh, political representative, at all. And 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 I think it's it, it's important in all of this, Philip, that we um, we we take an impartial look uh, when when there is a threat to to staff, be it. Painted on a wall or not, we have to take that extremely seriously. Well, can, can I ask you, Peter, uh, and maybe yeah. through you, the chief executive? I mean, you mentioned my party colleague, Ian mm. Friary, uh, who was the victim of threatening graffiti uh, on the 29th of February. It mentioned his name uh, with the crosshairs and uh, the village of a hall. He he was contacted that day by the PSNI to tell yeah. him of a threat. Mm. No council official ever contacted Ian Friary after that threat appeared. No council official contacted him to ask him how he was. No, could they do anything for him? There was no, as far as I'm aware, council didn't implement any kind of procedures to carry out an assessment of councillor Ian Friary's safety, how he could carry out his business uh, attending council 
going to council meetings, how that might impact on council staff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I agree with you in terms of taking threat seriously. And, and there is a clear identifiable threat that no council officer, as I said, and I'm going to repeat it, contacted the councillor in question to, to, to express concern, to ask him how he was, to carry out any kind of assessment. So, I mean, I'm glad you brought that point up because it allowed me to make my, that point. And, and I think it's very, that's very much the role of the PSNI, uh, Philip. And certainly, you know, um, I have welcomed those that have uh, inquired about the safety of our staff at, at the port. And, you know, I, I really uh, appreciate the, the sentiments and also the concerns raised by the committee for the safety of our staff. But I have to bring you back, Philip, because this was taken across the parties at the council meeting. There was a 40 minute debate in close council. It was close because members could ask what they wanted to ask. And they threat assessment. We have a duty, a duty to our staff in terms of the protection, their protection, their right to life and to make sure that we proactively, and it says it very clearly in the legislation, we proactively take actions to protect their their, their, uh, their lives and their safety. Mm. And if one of those officers feel in any way unsafe, unhappy or uncomfortable, then we're not doing our job. We have an extremely low threshold when it comes to the safety of our staff. So, and you know, we also have a responsibility to take positive action to ensure that officers are not compromised in any way. Safety will always come and always should come first before any other consideration at all times. A zero tolerance approach is taken in this council. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I, this is my final question, Chair, and appreciate and thank you for allowing me a bit of latitude. N- nobody's going to disagree with any of those points about the safety yeah. of staff. My, my, my point is that as an elected representative, I make a decision based on the information provided to me and the way it is presented. And I've read your report, and it's clear from my reading of your report that you were putting more stock on the information being provided by representatives on the ground, who I assume are unionist representatives on the ground, who are politi- politically motivated to see the ending of the protocol. You, in fact, wrote, as you have now confirmed, a letter to the British Cabinet Office expressing political views and concerns about the protocol. So if, if an elected representative is presented with information in a particular way and not given the full facts, I mean, if I was presented with information that uh, we have contacted the PSNA eight times and they've come back and said the threat level is low, that it's graffiti and social media activity, I wouldn't be particularly concerned. If I'm presented with information that says the UDA are behind a threat, that number plates are being targeted, that the trade unions uh, have expressed its serious concerns, all of which we now know to be false, then I'm going to come up with a different uh, a different answer. So given that we now know, uh, Anne and, and the Mayor, that the threat level to staff was low, that the information used to make this decision was embellished and exaggerated, as indicated by the trade union and others, do you feel, as a result of you not accepting the facts of the PSNI assessment, assessment and the pursuit of alternative facts, actually led to an increase in tension and actually led to an increase in fear among staff and directly fed into the council decision on the withdrawal of staff? No, no, and and, and sorry, I, I just don't don't accept that, um, Philip, because no. um, you know. There's a couple of points there I, I, I want to make, and, and I think you know we, we, we obviously have already explained uh, the, the rationale and the decision making uh, process that that we that we took. But I think what's really important uh, in all of this is that um, we, we had to act, and, and and you were given the same answer by the the permanent secretary of DERA. We had to act with the information that we we had at hand, and and this notion that we somehow were just. Uh, listening to, to unionist representatives about the concern, I mean, I, I have to distance myself from that because that's just uh, not the case. And uh, and the, the other point we have to make as well uh, is that that those eight phone calls, and I, I just, I, the reason why I want to make this point is because 
the, the story has slightly changed. When we first heard from the, the, the PSNI, uh, when they when they uh, give evidence to you uh, last week, they said there was no communication. It's now been accepted that there was communication. And I just want to make sure the committee isn't under the impression that that, eight, that those eight phone calls, the police were, were telling us everything was Rosie in the garden. Can, can, I, can I assure you, I um, haven't been part of those phone calls, not all of them, but there was no assurance given to us until we went. The first verbal assurance mm. that we had from the Gold Command was on the 2nd of, uh, of February at that meeting. You can imagine how shocked I was to hear on the 1st of uh, February at the DERA, uh, the Solis meeting, that there was a gold command. Now, that gold command was set up by the PSNI after the first Kavidi incident, and there was a meeting on the 22nd. We knew nothing about that. So um, hopefully I've already explained uh, the rationale of how we, how we took our decision. It was sound and it was within the law, and I think that we stand over that. Absolutely. Now. Right, folks, there's a few more members I need to move on around. I can go back in again if there's any other uh, questions. Um, uh, okay. Um, John, John Blair. Uh, thank you, Chair. And can I thank the uh, Mayor and the Chief Executive for being with us and for the information provided both verbally and, and, and in written form. Can I assure them, in addition to that, that, that I and my party take um, the uh, welfare of local government staff very seriously indeed? So, so we do you understand um, the, the, the level of assessments that you had to make and um, also on this occasion I would like to extend my full support to the staff, especially at times of, of threats or difficulties. But if I could take us back, Chair, to the uh, correspondence with the Cabinet Office, can I ask the Chief Executive, and it probably is, is more for the Chief Executive than for the Mayor, um, mm -hmm. to confirm that she actually wrote to the Cabinet Office on the 30th of January 2021. Um, on behalf of the council, and that that was by email form and on council-headed paper, and not on behalf of Solus. Um, I, I wrote, as I said, I wrote as a senior uh, official of the national of a national uh, association of, of Solus. It may have been. I would have to check out. It may have been on on council-headed paper. I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but um, I can confirm that. And um, um, so and. That's really what I would like to, to say. I, 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 can't, I can't remember, John, to be honest. It's really understandable, the, the detail, but that, that will bring me directly to another question. Um, because the correspondence is signed off, um, Anne Donaghy, Clark, and Chief Executive, as I understand it. Um, but separate to that, and, and very importantly, in the interest of the openness and transparency around this inquiry, if that letter was sent to the Cabinet Office, and if that letter has, and I know that it has, uh, a section titled Security, then why was that letter not included in the 50-plus page uh, pack that you've presented us with today? Thank you. Thank you, John. And I think um, that's clear because the letter was not part of our consideration when we made the decision. And, you know, it's it's a separate role. It wasn't considered. That role is to highlight, to get um, some of the... Ireland EU task um, and finish exit group. In my role, like I've been working with the 11 councils, you will note in the evidence that I've had some five meetings under a lot of pressure in a short period, I think in six weeks. The reason why it was to ensure day one readiness was smooth. And I'm very proud that local government uh, under my leadership was able to ensure day one readiness and a smooth transition to, to those borders. So, you know, we have now a number of issues, which I'm happy to share with you, um, you know, in relation to uh, the uh, difficulties that we're now facing in the operational implementation of, the, of that protocol. Chief Executive, can I point out to you that, that both you and the Mayor have made mention, you, you in a written report, uh, if we assume that the 50 plus page written report uh, comes from you uh, as an official and the Mayor um, verbatim this morning made, uh, made this statement that the matter had become unashamedly, uh, uh, members of staff had unashamedly been mistreated, manipulated and exploited as a political football. On the business of a political football, can I point out to you, Chief Executive, that in your letter to the Cabinet Office on the 30th of January, you referred to that you had been advised by my local MPs, Ian Paisley, Sammy Wilson, both of those are understandable, they represent the area, but also Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who doesn't represent the area. 
Now, in that correspondence, you you have listed that you 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 have advised that that um you have been guided by three local MPs, um, from one political party. Can I ask you why then, either as chief executive or as uh, chair of Solus, you didn't, before corresponding with the uh, cabinet office, try to seek the views of other political parties at the MP level, their Brexit spokespersons or people who've been active in speaking on Brexit um, or the protocol? Can I put that to you? Because well, that, that's a one-party assessment. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I work, you know, in, in terms of, of this council area, it will be no surprise to know that this council area is a predominantly unionist council area. So, you know, I, the, I work with the posts and the political persuasion. If I may finish. Or to a member of parliament. John, if I may finish, if I may finish, um, you know, you've asked the question and it would, it would be really nice if you could let me answer it. So I, what, what I would say to you is, John, that, you know, um, it's irrelevant to me uh, what the what uh, party the MP is uh, is representing? It's irrelevant to me what the mirror party is. You know, I have worked over my twelve years as a chief executive with a, a wide range of political representatives. I'm a political in what I do. I work to the Nolan principles, and I also will tell you whether the mayor, an MP, is Sinn Fein, TUV, DUP. I will work with that person. It's the post I work with, not the political party. And I will say to you that in terms of this, I had an open discussion with the, all of the parties, with the group party leaders, given all the information. And I also, all of the parties, there were 39 out of 40 elected members in that chamber for 40 minutes, able to ask whatever questions they liked of me. I have a very good relationship with all of my elected members. I'm very pleased at that. And we work very well together to make decisions. You know, and as I said to you, the letter is a soulless letter. And, you know, it's, it's not relevant to this inquiry in terms of Midney Santrum's decision. Okay, well, I would put it to you, Chief Executive. I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was trying to bring us back to the point of um, an MP has mentioned who doesn't represent the area. And I, I'm not satisfied that that's been answered, but I'm happy to move on to uh, another question. The uh, letter also references um, emerging issues and cars and registration numbers. Now, the police have not substantiated that. So, why was that on the 30th of January put to the Cabinet Office? Well, um, John, if, if, if I can take that, that question, because there, there has been, um, and I know it was uh, referenced earlier by your, your colleague to uh, Philip McGuigan too, there, there has been um, a lot of talk around the, the issue of, of number plates. And, and I think it's, it's important to, to, uh, to, 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 to put right that, that, yes, on the day, I can, I can remember, I um, uh, had associated the, the issue with, of number plates to the trade unions. Um, mistakenly, and, and I clarified that after that. You know, we, we were given a lot of information on the day. We had very, very short time frames to put together uh, to put together statements for decision making. But the the, the issue of, of of number plates um, not only has it um, we, we were made aware of it, but not only has it um, uh, appeared and, and actually in, in the evidence pack, um, you'll see that there, the, on social media there were there were images put up. Of cars that were being uh, monitored at the port, and uh, this just didn't come from us, and and we're still waiting. Um, uh, you know, for, you mentioned that the police didn't uh, substantiate it, but I mean, it, it's in your report, and it, with your permission as well, I just would like to show you um, a quick uh, clip here. This was this was on on national uh, news from the the, the general week, secretary of the union. Threats to workers cause checks at port to be suspended. People will hunt death threats. Uh, against them and those information being gathered about them, the number of plates were being taken, etc., uh, which norm normally would indicate that people are being targeted for attack. And, and, and I think as well, I mean, I'm, just the, the picture we're trying to paint with this is that on, you know, we have been given lots of information. Um, there's lots of, of, of widely available information and, and you know, you're, you're, you're quite right in pointing out the police were not very forthcoming with uh in, in supporting us and 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 either backing this information up or or or, or putting it 
putting it to, uh, to bed. I mean, that, that's the the, the uh, national secretary there of of a, of a large union. So. I think it's important. And I, I, I'll build on that because we did hear, you know, just to, to bring maybe this point, we did hear from staff who were really concerned when they saw slowing vehicles and, you know, and that I was given by a member of staff pointed to an anti, anti protocol website where it showed vehicles. It's an appendix three, there's a, a still of it. I'm happy to provide the full video to, to mm -hmm. where they actually showed vehicles traveling in, was recorded. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was extremely, extremely concerned. What I will also say, um, John, is that's happened again. I don't know if you're aware, but on the 21st, 22nd of March, Port staff in Belfast ha experienced exactly the same thing as what our staff experienced in Lorne. There was people there recording, they sent slowing and stationary vehicles, video recordings, photographs been taken, and that was confirmed then at Gold Command meeting. So that did happen as well, you know, and I think that the difference there, there was already a threat assessment, a written threat assessment in place, and some of their, their some of their inspections had to be stood down. I, I'm aware that staff were asked if, if you felt unsafe, you could go home or you could go into a compound. And, you know, I think it's also important, if you, if you would allow me, John, to point out, law and ports are very different place the Belfast port. There's only one way in and one way out in Lauren Port, right? So if, if somebody is monitored in a vehicle, there's one way in, one way out. Belfast, there's multiple. The Belfast staff are in a compound that is secure. My staff sitting outside and don't enjoy the, the surroundings of the port. They're outside in an office with one security guard, 12 young people. You know, you have to take the seriousness of this from our point of view. You've got multiple graffiti in Belfast, the graffiti and, and the chief executive of Belfast confirmed on the 1st of, of, of uh, February at the DERA meeting. The graffiti in Belfast was, down, was about political parties. The graffiti in Mid East Downtown was about staff, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and they had to drive past that day in and day out. And in addition, and, and in addition to that, in Larne, you know, the the, the tension it emulated in Larne, and it has since went to Belfast. And you know, we did try; we took as much as we could down in terms of the graffiti. Mm -hmm. We actually went to the Department of Justice to try to get more money to take more graffiti, and we we always get out to try to get the graffiti down. So we have tried our utmost best, you know, to, to yeah. do what we can. And, and I give you that assurance, John. It's a, it's a very unique, we're, on, on, we're in uncharted waters. Mm. Like, we have not done this before. And like, you know, there are lots of, but we have tried our best to make this work and to be smooth on it. And we are flagging up issues. But I will tell you this, if we had had that, if we would have had the threat assessment in within 24 hours, as we were promised, we would have had that back. We would have had the staff back, you know, and only only last, only two weeks ago, or maybe last week, the DFC closed the offices that our staff were in. And our staff couldn't do their, their work for, for for maybe 40 hours. And that's the exact same circumstances, Sean. You know, it's, it's not and I know the report helpfully gives give detail of, of issues that happened after the 1st of, of February as well. And also, you, you've given information on the layout of the site, the, the geography, etc. I appreciate that. But very specifically, and then I, will, I will finish share, share on this, uh, by the way. Um, you, you, Chief Executive, put in writing to the Cabinet Office, um, either on behalf of the, your council or, or both, and I quote, I am aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups and recent protests at Lauren Port, and have escalated this to senior PSNI and executive officials. Yeah. You then go on to say that cars entering and exiting the port are being monitored and registrations collected. And you add to that, I quote again directly, I now feel compelled to take measures to protect the health, safety and well-being of my staff. I put it to you that there weren't actually any protests that had been held by the 30th, by the 30th of January. So, so I add to that and put it to you also, that so the, fir the first thing I would say, John, if I could just John, this. the first thing I would say is that letter, you will note that that letter was written in confidence. I'm not sure where you got that letter, but I certainly didn't provide it to you. And so uh, that's the first thing. And, and I will come back to you privately about that. But in, in, in addition to that, what I will say is that um, I was made aware at 
grassroots level and at political level. Now, I will. I have a great respect for my elected members. They are absolutely fantastic. Each of my elected members are elected, and most of them live within the communities that that they represent. So they hear things on the ground. And I can tell you, I'm a chief executive, 12 and a half years, John, one of the longest serving. And I, I know that in, when an elected member uh, tells you something or says something, nine and a half times out of 10, and more likely 10 times out of 10, they are right, there's something in it. So I could never, in my job, I could never ever ignore a, a word uh, from, from anybody. I couldn't take that risk. I absolutely couldn't take that risk. But, um, you know, and um, at the time, at the time that um, that I uh, said that, said about paramilitaries, I absolutely that is what I was told, and I asked for confirmation from the PSNI. It, it, it took them four days to confirm, but you see, the minute I got the risk assessment, that was put straight back. You know, and you know, and I that's all I can tell you. You know, we have uh, you know, I, I, as I say, I I will come back to you privately a, a, about that. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, I would remind us, and maybe you can clarify this later question. Um, I'm still keen to know why that this correspondence wasn't included in the pack of information for us in the, in the transparency. And I will repeat it once again for you because it was nothing to do with the decision making process. You know, the scope of the terms of reference of this committee and this inquiry was asked to say what led you to what were the events that led you to the the um, the decision. That was not the that was not in that consideration. Okay, then. thank you, John. Um, uh, Patsy. <laughs> Yes, sure. uh, thank you both, Mr. Mayor and uh, Chief Executive, for attending today. Um, I have to say some of the stuff for me has, has raised more questions than it has given answers, particularly in regard to the, the letter. I would, I would clarify for you, and it is for the committee to determine what is relevant as evidence to that. And from what I've heard from that letter, and indeed the, the stuff that you have included in that letter, um, without having received the police risk assessment and conveying that to Cabinet does lend me to believe that we should have sight of that letter. Um, but um, if we could just ask, in writing that letter, were you writing on behalf of Solus, which is the entire uh, Chief Executive for Northern Ireland? I think I've already clarified, uh, Patsy, that on a number of occasions to the committee today. But I would disagree with you in terms of, you know, if you we, we have come here to uh, give an account of how we come to the decision. And I have answered that you have 57 pages of what we considered in terms of making that decision. The mayor may want to comment, but that was not part of the consideration, you know. And um, and so I so I believe um, very clearly I have I answered exactly what I was asked from the committee. Yeah, and I think just for um, just for complete clarity too, you know, uh, if I can, uh, Patsy, on, on the day when, when we were presented with uh, with the evidence. That letter certainly had nothing to do with our well, decision. In fact, it wasn't even mentioned. And in fact, and as far as I'm aware, Chief, you can clarify, it wasn't even uh, uh, sent until the third, which was which was after the the, the fact. And I think that the, the the frustration for me, Patsy, if if I can, is that that this inquiry now and and the line of uh, questioning, which is what's disappointing me, is that it has turned into uh, some sort of political. Uh, circus, for want of a better word, because the thing I really want to get back to and, I, and the thing I want to really reiterate is the decision-making process around removing the staff was non-political okay. and was purely based on the health and safety of our staff. Um, and and, and I, can't, I can't stress that point enough. Absolutely, Peter, and I agree 100%. Can I assure you of one thing? All I want to establish is the facts around decision making process and if yeah. the facts involve information which Anne had which she then previously uh, put on to a letter which was sent to the cabinet office on behalf of Solis which is uh, there's a number of other local government bodies in that well then clearly they would have had to be consulted if it was on their behalf that hasn't been clarified to me either um, but nevertheless um, it'll be for the committee to establish that Anne and it's within the committee's remit to do that. Um, that's our decision, not anyone else's. Um, so, 
Um, Patsy, I would just say, I, I would just say that you have a very thorough 57 page document of how we come to the decision and everything that we considered as, as part of our decision making is in that. And I will say it once again that the letter that you're speaking about, which you say, you know, there's so many other questions that we, we, we can answer in relation to the 57 pages, you know, and I, I can see that co the committee really want to talk about this letter. It is not pertinent to this inquiry. Sorry, Adam, um, with the greatest of respect, I have not seen the letter, so therefore I cannot determine whether it's relevant or pertinent or not. I can't make that presumption without seeing it. Again, back to that point, evidence-based and facts. Yeah. That's all I can determine. Now, um, just if, if you could, you referred earlier there to uh, reports from, um, uh, in your first, in your initial presentation, you said there were reports of elements linked to criminal gangs or criminal gang. Um. Um, reports from and who were they to? Yeah. So um, you will see, uh, again, I'll draw you back to the evidence and it says there very clearly that there was a pol political grassroots level that uh, referred to an individual who had um, been linked to uh, drugs and, and criminal, criminal activity and that was reported through to the police and um, they, I, I assume they have taken that as part of their assessment but that come from, from uh, through information through to me and I reported it through to the police Patsy, oh. which, which you would expect me to do. Well that's what Dennis McMahon, I'm getting to that point. So a formal report was made to the police, the PSNI by yourself in regard to potential risk from someone associated with drugs, stroke, criminal gang. Now okay. you that ACC Singleton said that no report or no complaint had been received by the PSNI from uh, or on behalf of Midney Santhrum Borough Council. You will have heard that. So that 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 is confirmed that that complaint was made. You have said that clearly here today and clarified that to us that that complaint was made to the PSNI. Yes, and I, I made that complaint to the PSNI over the weekend of the 30th to 31st. And um, and you will see that there was eight phone calls made as well. And, you know, I can give you a log of, of all, all of the calls. But what I will say is that, the as the mayor has pointed out, that the SEC, the temporary SEC Singleton, he, you know, I, I find it strange because he wasn't actually involved in any of this. I know he gave the evidence, but I can tell you, Patsy, he was not the the SEC that was involved during the period of of what we're talking about. So, you know, in terms of, of the evidence, I, I, I do note that he said, to the best of my knowledge, as far as I know. Um, so you have to remember from, from our point of view, and we all know this, Northern Ireland is in a very fluid position. You know, there is so much um, happening. And for us, once again, the safety of the staff is hugely important. Mm -hmm. We have duties under the Health and Safety at Work, the Human Rights Act, and you know, I, and you would be you would be inquiring to me and to the mayor if we hadn't have taken action. I do recall the permanent secretary said, "When you get information, you have a decision to make." And I agree with him. And you either make the decision to go ahead and put people at risk, or make the decision to protect them until you get the documentation that you need and the assurance. That's what we did. If we had to do it again, given the same circumstances. We would do exactly the same. Uh, uh, Mayor, I would pass yeah. to you a lot. And that, yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry, yeah. I just wanted to, to, to reiterate on that. You know, um, I think the other thing that I would point to is that you were also um, told at this committee uh, that there, there was no communications between the PSNI and Mid and East Antrim. And we have now been able to say uh, that, that there has been. So okay. I'm certainly not, make, I, I'm not jumping to any conclusions. Of that. I'm just. It, you know, telling you the facts, Pat, Pat, you quite rightly said, you, you, this committee is here to, to establish and hear the facts, uh, and, and those are the facts of, of, of the matter. You know, the other fact as well that I think we need to consider very strongly is that it took four days for the threat assessment to come back from the police. And actually, one of the things that, that slightly alarmed me um, uh, on the on the evidence giving session last week was that the words, and I, and I, I wrote them down when, when, when he said it, was that that the threat assessment 
hadn't uh, hadn't started. They hadn't actually started producing the threat assessment until the Thursday, and then, if I remember correctly, said it was sent then three hours later. Now, to me, that was that was alarm bells. That was extremely concerning, given that the amount of con- of, of concern and apprehension we were showing as a council, the amount of times the chief executive and her team had been had been calling to you know for for an update of the threat assessment, which even then resulted in having to chase the chief ex- the the, uh, the chief constable's office for this to then be told that the threat assessment hadn't started to be produced until the Thursday. I mean, to me, I don't know what you can draw from that, and that's that's really for for the, the, the committee, but personally speaking, I was really disappointed to, to hear that. Well, just on two things, just for complete clarity, in mm. um, response to my question to ACC Singleton, it wasn't about communication with the council. I've noted that you've drawn that very strong distinction, uh, and it's very clear that there was communication with the council my question, whatever about other queries to ACC Singleton, was that about if there had been any complaint made for investigation to the PSNI. Now, Anne, you have very clearly confirmed that, and I'm sure you can corroborate that with, with telephone logs or emails or whatever that is. But just um, bringing you on previous to, just as you were listening, I was listening there very carefully to what you were saying about your obligations to mm-hmm. follow through and to see things through. Um, Mr. Ellison from Unite um, referred to an email, and you've you've apologised, Peter, for for the issues around uh, the misinterpretation of that at, at council. I appreciate you doing that, um, but um, he did refer to in the email that was sent to uh, Mr. Richard Cromie. I think that's your head of your current head of HR. That's right. Um, he he did refer to, and you you have the text of the email there, but um, he. It was talking about the NI protocol, the Brexit NI protocol, and the appearance of um, staff apparently being threatened via graffiti, and particularly other methods for carrying out their role. Now, I did ask him, did anyone from the council uh, ring him up or ring his senior officer up to establish what those other methods were? Uh, thereby, now, there's quite a bit of c- communication by email. There was no communication by email. There were no phone calls. There was no referral to the PSNI to follow that up, which I would have anticipated should have happened if there were other methods. Uh, clearly, that would be a bit of a red flag to me. Um, that was done. Is there any explanation as to why that wasn't done? Well, if I could just um, uh, first come in on that, uh, Patsy, I think it's, it's it's worth saying too. We we have a very strong positive relationship with with our unions, yeah. um, and and that goes back uh, a long while. And and you know, we, following this this incident, we we had a, a very productive and positive meeting again uh, with with union reps uh, afterwards to to discuss it. And I think that's really important because um, when we received the, that email. And I think actually it's testament to the chief executive and her team. Uh, when we received that email, we didn't start to sit back and ask questions and challenge them. And well, well what do you mean serious threats? And that's a big allegation. You know, when when they mention in in the email potentially serious threats, that's that's that is serious. You know, and the 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 fact that the chief executive has the relationship and the trust built up with the unions. We were able to take that uh, at face value, and it was it was the right thing to do to, to take it at face value. And, and I would like I would also say to you, Patsy, you know, this was the day of full council. Things were moving very fast. Mm. You know, this was all happening on the first. So, you know, I I attended a number of meetings and took a number of telephone calls, and you know, um, you know, we have been speaking with the unions after, but we had enough information from. Um, between the unions, between our staff, between um, different grassroots level, uh, etc., to to know that there was a concern. Like I always say, at the end of the day, if if any that sign alone, the, the graffiti mm-hmm. alone. So hopefully that that clarifies for you. So well, actually, it doesn't. Um, okay. it doesn't. It doesn't tell me why other methods. What those other methods? That, those other methods could have been much more sinister. They could have been much more dangerous, eventually. And I have to say that uh, for whenever that would be flagged to me, the risks mm. and everything, um, on the basis of that email, was there a referral made to the PSNI? Well, and, and I'm sure, um, Patsy, if I can, I'm sure you, you, would, you would accept that when we receive an email like that, 
that um, it's a matter for the PSNI to determine those, those serious threats. Um, and it's important for us as a public organization and as an employer to act within the safety of our staff and to ensure there is no risk. So, of course, when, when, when we received um, that entry, as we did from a number of stakeholders on the day, um, that was that was formed that formed our decision making process. Well, sorry, what I'm trying to establish here is yes. where there are potential uh, sources of evidence or leads, um, those need to be referred to the PSNI for follow up. Um, and, and what what I will say is, you know, we we considered um, and communicated back to the trade unions. You know, the trade unions for their members, they also have a duty to, if they feel it's serious enough to report mm. it through to the PSNI themselves. So, you know, it's not just down to one organisation, yeah. but we reported through everything that we got to the best of our ability to the PSNI. I will confirm with you, Patsy, um, I, I just can't tell you off the top of my head, sure. but I will confirm that with you, Patsy. I think ultimately as well, uh, Patsy, I, I, I would also um, suggest that uh, if it was in fact the the author of this email that uh, you, you know used those words potentially serious threats, I would perhaps suggest that actually there's there's an onus on on that yeah. individual to report it to the police. Absolutely. It's, I think there's also a care a duty of care by the employer whenever that's relayed through to them, and mm -hmm. because we've heard that mentioned about your care of staff, which you have a duty to, and I appreciate you're trying your best for your staff and what could have been, as was referred to yourself, by a very fluid situation. Um, Patsy, hopefully, hopefully you will see in the decision-making process that we have provided to you in both written and verbal today mm -hmm. that we did we did fully yeah. fulfil our duty of care to our staff, and yeah. we're, very, we're very proud of that. Well, well, I'm sure you are. Um, all I'm trying to do is establish the factual process here in circumstances where an email referred to other methods was passed on to a senior member of your staff. You said that that was referred that the issue was referred to police. All I'm trying to establish is that all the potential leads, all the elements of evidential pursuit that could have been followed by the PSNI were fully pursued. Now you said, Anne, you're going to come back to the committee and confirm if that was done. I appreciate that. And I, I will write to the chair and I, I will let the chair know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, we have a, moving on here to Harry. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Mayor Johnson, Chief Executive Donnelly. Thanks for taking part today and for being present. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so I've placed in the same position again. Would you do things differently? And can you assure your staff, employees, that their their safety will always be put first? Thank you. I think that's a very good question, um, Harry, and, and thank you for that. Because uh, underneath all of this, we have twelve members of staff who have been left seriously uh, emotionally traumatized by this whole ordeal, and. Um, it's really important, first and foremost, for us as an employer, that we number one act within their interests of, of health and safety, but two that we, we we take their their mental welfare and 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 take that very very seriously. And we and we as a council, to be fair to the chief executive, are, have been very strong on that. And I think one of the 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 the, the points that's worth worth noting is that throughout all of this and. And this, again, the, the, the members of staff that have been affected are the 12 HOs, but we had an entire organization looking to us, looking to our chief executive for leadership here. And we need to make sure, and, 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 and where I'm getting to is if, if we were to make, we're in the same situation again, presented with the same facts on the day, we absolutely would make that decision again because yeah. it was the right decision to do. We, uh, as mentioned in, in my report, we, we took a, a safe, not sorry approach. Um, and thirdly, we need to give staff the utmost confidence that we have their best interests and their safety at heart. And if I could add to that, Harry, you know, we have a, we have a fantastic staff. You know, I, w I would just say we are an award-winning council. Mm. The performance in this council is so high. And, mm. you know, 
So our staff are, are the, the result of that. And the reason why our staff are so motivated and go the extra mile every time is because they know that we, we have their backs. We will always take their health, their safety, their well-being. And we're one of the leading councils in terms of well-being programmes in this council. Because, you know, in, in a council, your staff is your is your biggest asset yeah. and we really really appreciate and have as i say a brilliant staff and our elected members continually will thank our staff for, for what they do because they are so good mm -hmm. yep. that's okay thank you and would you say communication from the psni was slow and common and therefore you had that quickly as in all situations of this nature if there's any risk at all you must take immediate action to protect your team yeah I, I would I would maybe even say that slow in coming is a slight understatement. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, with with this circumstance, um, and as as you'll have seen in the the correspondence, Harry, you know, it, it it almost took the chief executive to be you know chasing to the chief constable's office with a begging bowl for the threat assessment, mm -hmm. and that to me is what um, is, is what's kind of contrary about this whole thing. On one hand, um, we we are given this impression. There's no threat. Everything's fine. You know, there's no issue. But on the other hand, and, 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 you know, I was asked this many times by journalists when I was down at the port, you know, we would almost circa 3,000 additional police hours put down to the port. We, we had, you know, huge amounts of, um, of, of uh, increased policing presence. We even had armed, uh, armed response units um, down at the port. We had placed checks in and out of the port. In fact, I was talking to some residents in Larne and they said they hadn't seen um, a, a, as much you know, police presence from back in the days of the Troubles. And the point I'm making here is that that just doesn't balance up the scale. On one side, we're, we're hearing no threat, yet on the other side, we're hearing you know all of this increased activity corroborated by all the sinister graffiti, by the, the tensions that... Um, that uh, your, your colleague Philip McGuigan mentioned about earlier on, the tensions in the community, all of this together, but on the face of it, the PSNI saying no threat. And that's why, you know, as an organisation, we, we had to act quickly, had to take the decision fast. Um, and and, and I, I think there's still questions to be, to be answered as to why uh, it, it took so long for the threat assessment to come back. And maybe even a, a, a further question of clarification as to why the threat assessment hadn't started to be produced until the Thursday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Mayor Johnson and Chief Executive, I must say that I'm satisfied with your actions taken and I would thank you for them and I'm assured that you would do it again because I think we need it to, uh, for confidence in your staff and that's good. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that, for that validation. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary? Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much. And can I, can I thank you, Mayor Johnson and Chief Executive Donaghy, for your for what you've said so far this morning. Thank you. Um, my question is in relation to the Gold Command. You know, you do, we talk about or you, you described the increased activity by the PSNI. Yet you around the around the port, but yet you were you are one of the main stakeholders. In relation to the members of staff that you have in this port, can you think of why did the PSNI exclude you from that gold command body? Well, um, Good question. Rosemary, ex excellent question. And I think you would have to ask the PSNI. You know, I was extremely shocked, as was my colleague, Chief Executive, that there was a gold command. You know, surely as a key stakeholder, like you, you know, elected members know the community, they've great information, they understand, they're connected. So to me, it would make sense. And for me, in terms of the, uh, a meeting on the 22nd of uh, of January after the incident on the 21st. I'm never to be told about that. And I can also say we had a, a PCFP meeting after that, and it was never said that there was a gold command. You know, and you know, I I feel that we should have been. That has created a, a, a lot of a lot of suspicion and tension around what was going on. Why were we not included? Mm. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, also, I want to. You spoke. You spoke about you have twelve staff in Larne Port, and you need 
he, did you say was it 40 something? No, um, we have been informed by the Food Standard Agency um, to carry wow. out the full infection regime. We will need 72 staff, um, so we're 56, 56 staff. That is one of the concerns that we have raised to, to the high levels of, of the Cabinet Office to say we, we need to know where we're going to get these staff. We have asked for £4.8 million pounds to actually fund that. Now, and, and the Mayor pointed out um, uh, at, at a council meeting recently, if we are left with that bill as mid and east Antrim, that's 10% of our rates. So, of course, we're worried. We also have, at this minute in time, the 12 environmental health officers are, are doing 30% documentation checks which have been continued and they're doing a few identity checks we're not doing physical checks at the moment so um, for us to do and to put the full regime in the food standard agency has said that we need 68 ahos now there won't be 68 ahos available in northern ireland um, and then Belfast will also be looking. So it's it's really, really concerning and it is keeping us up at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, do you think, as, as you've said, you need more staff or you will need more staff. Do you think what has gone, now, gone on in the past now will have an impact on you actually trying to recruit staff? Um, and I think Dr. Huey said this last week. It's it, you know, getting people to work at, at a border control post is never a, the most attractive job when you're out doing enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say that it's it's without doubt that um, all of this tension will, will have have made it harder for me to recruit. Um, but it's twenty four seven posts. These people are working twelve hour shifts, sometimes in the middle of the night, obviously, and you know. Um, they they're, they're could be vulnerable, so you know it's an added it's an added extra um, I suppose burden on, on safety and security that we must take account of. And you know there's also the added issue of you know the charging because it says in the Northern Ireland Protocol that we must charge. Hmm. We have absolutely no idea who's going to be doing the charging. How much is going to be? There is no IT system. There's been no conversations about that. So I feel very justified, and it was my duty to highlight those issues because yeah. those are serious, long-term issues for Northern Ireland PLC. Okay, thank, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Yes, yeah. uh, William. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, William, I got you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And can I thank uh, thank uh, the mayor uh, and the chief executive for their uh, detailed uh, presentation to us today? Um, I, for one, I'm disappointed that we are. I, I didn't support this inquiry because I thought it was a waste of time. I think our committee has much more valuable things to do. I think we've there's many issues that are testing our agri cultural sector. While we are haranguing a chief executive and a mayor about a sensible decision taken to, to, for the safety of their own staff, I think that is wrong. It's an absolute witch hunt, been led by a party uh, that, had a, that was tied to uh, a little more political wing, a former organization that brought havoc and destruction and death to Northern Ireland for many years. I'm disappointed also, may I say, that the first person to speak and ask questions today got one half hour. I think this committee, uh, we need to look at this. I think it's ridiculous that one member got a half an hour to ask questions. I, again, I'll just say to the group, or to the Chief Executive and uh, to the Mayor, there was a, uh, you did mention that there was some social media reports uh, and uh, threats on social media. Could you expand a wee bit on that? Yeah, and uh, th thank you for your 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 question, and 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 you're right. I mean, on your on your earlier points, you know, obviously we we were very disappointed that that uh, that our our decision, and ultimately, I think we felt our decision to to remove staff and, and our actions to act within the health and safety of our staff. We felt that decision was was disrespected, and and ultimately now knowing that not only have we had the Department of Communities. 
uh, they closed down their offices. Uh, similarly, we have the EU inspectorate pull out staff. We have Adira who have pull out staff, and there was also um, there, there was also uh, Belfast Port. Uh, 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 that, that had staff removed, none of which have had to face uh, an inquiry. And I think the point you made, um, William, is, is quite right. This has not only um, taken up a lot of your precious time and your committee's precious time, but has has also uh, meant that that uh, myself and 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 more still the chief chief executive has had to, to, to combine all this. Day. And you'll have seen it's a fifty seven page document. It's a it's a lengthy and. For me, I mean, it's 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 case closed, and and um, and uh, in, in terms of our decision making, and what I think is is disappointing is is that particularly in the time that we are in, and in the challenges that we have at the minute in Northern Ireland, is that that our chief executive, your committee, uh, uh, me as the mayor, we have been pulled uh, to going back over a decision that was taken to protect our staff. Um, which, which obviously is um, is disappointing, and, and what has ended up happening uh, with that, William, is that, as I mentioned in, in my opening statement, is that our staff um, throughout this then turned into a bit of a political football, and uh, and that was that was kicked back and forward, um, and uh, and and. Uh, I regret to say it, but it was also it, it was it has been used as a political football in in, in the committee. Uh, which is which is very disappointing because ultimately at the at the bottom of this we have twelve VHOs who are extremely concerned for for their safety. We heard last week in in the evidence uh, session when we, we when we heard from uh, the chief vet, we heard from the permanent secretary of Deer and even from the the PSNI themselves that there is there there was genuine concern even from staff that weren't EHOs at the time in the port genuinely concerned for their safety and that's a that's a really unfortunate um, position to be in and you know as a as a council and in fact as any organisation any business you have to protect your staff as the chief executive quite rightly said your staff are your number one asset and we had to move to act. Um, in relation to your, your question with regards to social media, that was certainly, uh, uh, as, as we've uh, demonstrated and, and uh, tried to show in the evidence pack, that was certainly one of the factors that, that was, was considered. And I think what um, reiterates from all of that is that uh, not only did we have the likes of the menacing graffiti, which Truthfully, in my opinion, if that was another business, if, if there was a bakery outside and there was someone spray painted outside a bakery that their staff were targets and the owner of the bakery didn't pull their staff out of work, I would, I would, I would be asking serious question. But not only did we have that, we had the, 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 uh, the, the concerning letter from the union we're talking about potentially serious threats. We also had uh, the information of, of uh, staff number plates being taken, and that was presented on social media. We had the, the, the rising tension in, in the community, as uh, Phil McGuigan pointed to, and, and we also had uh, on social media, on various different uh, sites and websites, um, People, uh, you know, talking that this thread up. So we, we we had to act. You know, we had to take that that seriously. And and as we've, we've mentioned before, and the chief had mentioned before, I would be more concerned. In fact, I I, I almost feel um, uh, semi vindicated coming to this committee because I would be more concerned as a mayor, or actually had to have any connection with this council. I would be much more concerned coming in front of this committee had we not have taken that decision. On the day and having to ask questions and having to answer questions sorry as to why we didn't take staff out given we had all that information and i suppose given also um william thanks for your for your question given also the fact that there are so many different um aspects to think in terms of lauren port and belfast they cannot be compared they're mm. completely different hinterlands completely different geography completely different type of building completely so all of that had to be taken into the mix William. yeah and, and, and given all the information that you have given us today i think we uh, any reasonable person would accept that it was a sensible and wise decision to take in the safety for the safety of your staff so thank you very much thank you thank you okay then um i just want to say before we move around here that i, I don't I, uh, 
this certainly should not be seen as, as a witch hunt. Um, mm. The majority view of this committee who look into this incident, which is of major public interest. And um, I have given everybody a chance to have their say here. I'm trying not to curtail. One member. And I should say also you know, that this is of major public interest. And I never curtailed you. I never curtailed anybody today. Um, and I do believe that, as I just come back to the point there, is that we had a situation last week whereby the PSNA, PSNA ACC has told us that these were unsubstantiated and uncorroborated threats. He confirmed that there's no paramilitary involvement on the 2nd of February. So um, it is fair to say, again, and also in relation to the, the, the letter of the cabinet, that it does seem to be uh, the politics that come in that seem seemingly from the Mid East Antrim Council, from from what many people can see, and this has actually contributed contributed to increasing tensions. So it's only right and fair, and it's, it's, it's correct that we, as a committee, have made a decision to invest, look into this here, and I certainly don't want it to be seen as a witch hunt. Um, we're going to move on to Morris. 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 Yes, Chair, thank you very much. I'm having a wee bit of difficulty finding my buttons. You're okay, Morris. Uh, please don't push them. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor and Chief Executive. Good morning, good morning Morris. Uh, thank you very much for your answers. Uh, under what I thought was a wee bit of a forensic questioning session, but uh, I, I have no intentions of, of, of trying to drag this into a political realm. Uh, just a couple of wee points. I said last week, uh, as someone who was in the thick of a no warning bomb in Korean, mm-hmm. uh, my during my entire period of work has been at the height of the uh, of terrorism in this country, and I take any threat seriously, whether it's verbal, written, through social media or otherwise. And I would say, for the health and safety of staff, uh, that is a paramount decision that you made, and therefore, in my opinion, you made the correct decision and could have made no other. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were discussing the situation with, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, and I would like to ask what knowledge either of you as Chief Executive or Mayor would have on a newspaper report that a Larne Port worker and family had to be relocated to a safe location, a safe and secure location after a loyalist paramilitary threat, uh, and the reports would suggest the member of staff involved was a customs officer. The report in the newspaper also states the customs officer had reported the incident to the PSNA who found it to be credible. It goes on to suggest both the Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, and Home Secretary, Pretty Patel, were informed. When I put that to the uh, ACC from the PSNI last week, he informed me that the newspaper reports were incorrect. What is your knowledge of that threat and relocation? Is there any credibility to it, or is it, as the ACC said, a newspaper report not to be believed? I think um, th- thank you for your your, your question, and um, I, I think I, I have heard I, I was made aware of that of that instance uh, incident, and, and I am aware of uh, of the event. And I listened to the the um, the response from the PS, and I thought it was very um, it was v- very well prepared because first of all he he, he answered and said that it's uh, it's well within the PSNI's. Uh, Remit that they don't speak about current, uh, uh, you know, investigations or ongoing. You know, he, he mentioned that, and that's correct. But he then also answered the question quite carefully too, because he mentioned that um, that he was not aware of of any member of Larn Port staff. Now, why that to me is quite carefully answered is because what I was made aware was that this particular individual was a border post. Um, worker who worked between the three ports. So he's maybe been, I, 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 I don't want to certainly put any words into his mouth, but what I was made aware of was that a, a border force worker who, in actual fact, and this is the bit that, that concerned me when I was made aware of this information, who in actual fact had been working in Larnport the week that we took our staff out. And um, there's two, there's couple of points, if, if I can, uh, more so, that I want to raise on that. And the first is that if a, a, uh, any worker, be it they're based across the three ports or just in Larne or wherever, but given that he was working in Larne Port mm. the week that our staff had come out, why 
and on that on that basis was the, our council, our chief executive, not made aware of, of that fact. And um, to the, the second point I want to make, and, and this is more on the slight inconsistency of the approach of PSNI um, more generally, is that when the chief constable came into post, his, um, his mantra almost was community policing. And we all know that the heart of community policing is trust and relationship. Mm -hmm. And surely in this instance that if there is a member uh, of, of our civil service who was put out of his home, and from my information, from what I was given, the threat was delivered by the PSNI. And if that was the case, how can we be sitting here talking about trust and relationship and community policing when we weren't even told and we had 12 EHOs that had been pulled out of work for their safety. And, and Morris, if I could add to you, uh, council staff raised the issue of concern too and uh, the, our director here contacted PSNI at Gold Command on the 25th of February to ask if the allegation in relation to that member of port staff believed to be a border control officer working across the three ports was under threat and if the had and remove home uh, whilst they were working in Belfast Court. We have never received a response in relation to that email ever. As, uh, in addition to that, I also was contacted by a journalist, uh, a very a very high level uh, successful journalist, who actually um, had asked, you know, what, what was our information. So I actually decided I contacted Gold Command on the 19th of March to say I've been made aware uh, that there's a journalist asked this question. Um, it took ten days for an email to come back to me to confirm confirm, neither to confirm or deny that it happened. So, you know, um, that's as much as I know in, in terms of that. So I think you would need to ask the PSNI, but we did communicate to the PSNI uh, about mm. about the allegation on two, on two occasions. And, and if I can add, Chief, uh, uh, on top of that, I, I personally feel, uh, Morris, throughout this whole episode that we have been badly let down by the PSNI, and, and I don't say those words lightly. You know, that, that, that's a, a big statement for, for anyone to make. Um, but given the severity of this situation and, and, and given how serious the situation is, the, the level of, of communication and the, uh, the lack of transparency, if, if I can say, has been, uh, has been truly disappointing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, uh, I, I intend to write the PSNI to seek the answer, uh, but... Uh, I need to be very careful how I word it so that I get an answer to the actual question and not a, by, a byproduct of another question. So I think finally, I find it incredible that the PSNI would set up a gold command and not include the council at officer level. We would then have valuable information that could be fed into gold command through the elected representatives uh, on the council. And I would suggest that your council follow up on this failure because it is a failure. Uh, and I think the PSNI need to understand that they need to be in, in contact with elected representatives from whatever party, from whatever party, whenever they are setting up a gold command to get valuable feed in from, from, from elected representatives. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'll go on record by saying that the safety of staff in any circumstances is paramount in my opinion. And I think the council made the correct decision based upon the time frame and information available. And I would like you to take back to your council and staff that their safety is at the forefront of the members of this committee. And that despite the, 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 the question where we're trying to find out a reason for something happening, that their safety is what's our concern and will always be our concern. And I would thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Morris, for your concern. That we will pass that on. That is really, really kind. And thank you very much. The staff and the elected members will be really pleased to hear that. Thank you, Morris. Claire? Claire? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Ms. Donaghy and Mayor Johnson for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. I just want to go back. You showed a clip there of Patrick Mulholland, the Deputy General Secretary of NIPSA. Um, it was a media clip where he gave a statement to the media. Um, I just want to ask, did you speak to Patrick Mulholland before he gave that statement? 
I, I certainly didn't speak to him, no. No, neither did I. Okay. Um, I ask that just because we have had trade unions in speaking to us and I've read their statements to, to media as well. And we have the um, trade unions have asked, um, well, they've called into question what was put into the media in terms of what they have said. And mm. as I'm reading a media report here where we're the council statement said trade unions on behalf of council members of staff assist them with checks at the ports have raised serious concerns around the safety of staff and sought reassurances on what measures are in place to keep staff safe. But when we're hearing from the trade unions um, and other media outlets, we've got Alan Law, the TUS Secretary, has put out a statement on behalf of NIPSA, GMB and UNITE and demanded that the council withdraws the trade union remarks and asking the local authority to clarify which trade union made this claim. Yep. Has that happened? Yes, um, and, and I, I uh, clarified that quite a, a few times. And uh, thanks for your, your question, Claire. So, just to, to give a bit of um, background on it, we we obviously um, we we had the, the the group party leaders meeting, which I sat in on on the afternoon, where uh, we discussed the issue and the and the, the information that was presented to us. I then took the decision because I thought it was important, and I'm, I'm sure that the committee would agree. Uh, I took the decision that uh, we would uh, put that onto the agenda as an item of priority for that council meeting that night. And, um, and I had a, a statement uh, uh, prepared that, that, that we prepared following the decision to take the, the staff out. I, I gave a, a, a statement uh, at the council meeting to clarify the council's position. Now, in that statement, um, uh, and, and it, it it does unfortunately boil down to the to, to a couple of words, but in that statement, it could have been misinterpreted that uh, I was trying to imply that the trade unions would have told us about the the presence of number plates. So I, I was more than happy to clarify that position, and, and I did so on national radio uh, on, on on the news and uh, and issued a couple of statements just to, for the avoidance of any any doubt. Um, to, to ensure that, that the issue of number plates was separated from from the, the trade unions. And we, we had a, a follow-up meeting with them after that, and it was very positive. Uh, and I was able to, to speak uh, with Alan Law as well and, and, and basically clarify the point again. But what that didn't take away from, and, and I think um, I just wanted to make this point, is that we still on that day had a letter from the unions which in my, in my opinion and certainly of the council's opinion when we made the decision was uh, e extremely concerning they raised potential serious threats um and and to me you know as mentioned before we have a very positive relationship with our with our unions and and i think the right thing for us to do on the day was to to trust the words that, w that were given to us and and take the unions at, at face value because ultimately and i'm sure the chief executive will agree ultimately as a council uh, and, and as a trade union we both harmonize in our desire for for staff safety and well-being yeah thank you very much can i ask then just uh, i know that you're saying you've got good strong relations with the unions and that's mm. brilliant to hear from big supporter of trade unions uh, so is there ongoing um, communications between yourselves and the unions is that a, a constant conversation? We, we would have regular meetings, Claire, with uh, the trade unions, and um, we are actually quite, uh, at, we've had a, quite a number of agreements with them in terms of the well-being of our staff, and uh, we're, we're at the stage now that we're at hopefully going for a final ballot on our unified terms and conditions, which I have to commend the trade unions for. We've worked very hardly from, from a management trade union side, and it's a real big achievement that hopefully we will be announcing a, a positive of outcome in the, in the num next number of mm. weeks and months. So trade unions have worked well with us. We've always, we have a great respect for each other. And I think the fact that if whenever uh, the issue was raised, the mayor and myself took time out. We met the three major trade unions, represented us, we talked it out with them and we got a resolution because we all have to work together to to ensure the, the best deals and the best opportunities for our staff. So yeah. I, I, that work I continue and will continue, Claire. That's just on that one then. So how are things for staff now? 
Thank you for asking, Claire. Um, and you know, things things are settled. However, we we do we keep a continuous review on our risk assessment. It, like it is a document that is live. We keep we keep examining it. You know, we are aware that, you know. Um, I suppose the decision for the Department of Communities last week to close the offices did sort of upset them a little bit. But, you know, again, we spend a lot of time with all of our staff and in particular to real focus um, communicating with the staff. And I, I have to commend the director and, and, the, and the girl, the senior officer, uh, Elaine, that oversees them. Fantastic, fantastic experienced officer. So the staff are good and we my big concern Sir, now it's clear as where do I find 56 other EHOs? Well, that's what I was asking. So, has there been any further, or sorry, that's what I was thinking, any further since the graffiti appearance since all this happened? Um, they're all together, um, and again, I'm not going to be able to give the, uh, the total amount, but there has been like over 80 pieces of graffiti. There has been some other sinister graffiti. Um, there has been, uh, I suppose, if you read it in the in the written document, there has been a couple of contractors that were spoken to by by whoever to say, you know. We don't want you to do this work. So and so, you know, there, there's little things has continued. It has settled down now, which we're really, really pleased about. And we continue, Claire, to put everything, anything that happens, we put it straight to the gold command and to the police. And, and uh, in fairness to the police, they have on a regular basis from once we got all sorted out, they would regularly now email us to say there's no change to the credit system, there's no change. So that, that, that's very reassuring for council, for me, for the staff, but we continue to review our risk assessment on, on a weekly basis. And no further reports of staff number plates been taken since then either then? Well, other than the, the than the incident that I rose in Belfast on the twenty first, twenty second of March, there was that incident. Yes. Well, that's really good to hear, particularly in light of the escalation of violence right across Northern Ireland in recent weeks, um, and also with your your own expressed concerns, Ms. Donnelly, there, and how all this may impact on the future recruitment of the urgently needed new staff that is required to um, help the staff. Can I ask, have you done any risk assessment or health and safety checks on the conditions that staff, um, just uh, I'm thinking about the numbers of staff that you currently have, the numbers of staff that you do need, how the current staff are overworked, um, and have you done any um, health and safety risk assessment for the current conditions? Claire, that's a really, a really good question. And I wrote first to the minister in December because the temporary facilities that we were promised on the 1st of January weren't going to be ready. And I wanted to make sure, A, that they were going to be adequate and B, that, you know, that staff were going to be in, in, in an environment that was suitable. Um, we eventually, we offered them the town hall, but eventually they've agreed to the AFC offices. What I can say is that we're disappointed that the, the, the permanent building has been, uh, as Dr. Huey said at his last, at the, at the Evans, has been pushed out now to 2023. So uh, we do carry out continuous assessments, but in terms of our staff, our staff are not overworked, but they're at full capacity. The 12 EHOs, and I just bring you back, Claire, we only are doing 30% of the documentation checks at the minute, and then we're doing some identification checks. But when we have to take on more inspections, as we are told we're going to have to, plus physical, then we will be in a position where the 12 EHOs couldn't do that. Um, thanks for that. We're very, very well aware on committee. You know, we get regular updates from officials and written briefings from the department. I'm just worried about the concern. I mean, the concern really is on the impact of staff at the minute. We know exactly what's needed and how quickly it's needed. Thank thanks. you for your Thank concern, you. Claire. Thank you. Right. Um, okay. Phil, can you, Phil, you want to very, very briefly just to end here, eh? Yes, yes. Uh, just, I mean, two small points and a yes and no answer will suffice. I, I, I just, from the interjection of the mayor when John was questioning uh, the chief executive about the solace letter, it's, I mean, the mayor seemed to indicate that he, he was aware of it. He said it wasn't relevant, which is why it wasn't provided. So can I just ask the mayor if he has got sight of this confidential letter that the chief executive has wrote and said she wrote on behalf of solace? Yeah, I think, um, uh, Philip, with, with, with respect again, the, the, the point I was making uh, when John asked the question is that the, the letter um, that, was, that, that you're talking about 
had no bearing and had absolutely no implication on the, the decision making process and that's what we're, we're, we're trying to reiterate to the committee because what we wouldn't want um, the committee to feel is that somehow there's this letter going on in the background and, and that this was all intertwined. It certainly wasn't and, and I really wanted to make the, the point clear. No, no, no. And, and you've, made, you've, made, you've, you've made that point and the chief executive has made the point. I'm just asking the question, have you seen this letter? Well, I, the, whenever I was answering the question um, earlier with, with, with John, it was very, very important that I uh, made clear to the committee that when we were making the decision that the letter didn't come into account. So, no, in answer to your question, no, I hadn't seen the, the letter. And, and whenever, uh, nor had any of the other group party leaders, and yeah. certainly nor had the council, because number one, um, our Have understanding... You seen Have you seen the letter now? Well, our understanding now is that the letter was written on the 3rd and the decision uh, was taken on the 1st. So the, the point being there would have been impossible in that uh, instance for the letter to be included. But secondly, um, that letter uh, wouldn't have had any bearing on, on our decision-making process anyway. Yeah, so, so you, 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 you've seen the letter now. Can I just clarify that you've seen the letter? No, and, and 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 so how do you know it's a no bearing? How, how do you know? I mean, you you uh, were you you weren't aware of the letter until today, yet you know that it has no bearing. Anyway, I'm just going to make that point. We're going we're going to see the letter. Uh, I, I just uh, one final point because I don't want to be accused of hogging the the meeting. A lot has been made today uh, by yourselves uh, about your dissatisfaction with the information being provided to the PSNI. Can I just ask to confirm? Uh, that when the threat assessment was given to Middle East Antrim Council, the staff returned to work? Yes. Okay, so within, within, the threat within assessment was given, uh, I mean, we haven't seen it, but obviously it contained information that was no different than what the police were telling you and staff returned to work. Well, I haven't personally seen the the, the, th the written threat assessment, but the, the, the important point of it is that we didn't act until that had been received. And I mean, once it, I mean, the council asked for a threat assessment, and you, as mayor, hasn't haven't even seen it. But yet you've, you 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 made, you made a decision that you said you couldn't make on the basis of maybe verbal. Maybe I, can, uh, maybe I can clarify that for you. Maybe I can clarify that for you, Philip, because um, when we received the written threat assessment from the PSNI, that was a restricted document. So um, I was duly bound that that wouldn't be shared. So just to let you know, that's a restricted document. So I would never share that with a political representative then. So, so, so there's not the then, full council is required to make a decision to withdraw staff but for, uh, the chief executive can make the decision to return them without full counsel. Absolutely, and I think there's a, there's a there's a very distinct difference there, and it's I think it's important to, to, that we we recognise that that when we when we removed staff and and actually the difference between uh, stopping a service and starting a service is, is very different. Mm -hmm. So when we uh, removed staff, uh, I took the decision to put it on the council agenda because it was it was of uh, number one it was of grave concern. Uh, that the information we had and the, 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 the sinister threats towards our staff. Um, and it was very clear during those discussions that we would be uh, asking for a, a written threat assessment from the PSNI and would return the staff uh, uh, back when we received that. So Chief Executive is also the Chief of Staff. Yeah. And uh, I think the the, the Permanent Secretary of DERA made, made the point uh, much better than I would be able to uh, during his evidence uh, giving session last week in that ultimately he is responsible uh, for, for his staff and, and he has to act within the interest of his staff. Now, he took political, um, as he mentioned, he takes political guidance because, you know, it's, the, it's, a, we're, 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 it's a political organisation and council is no difference. It's a political world. But had something happened to our staff, it's the chief executive that's up in court for culpable manslaughter, not me. And, and if I may add to that, um, uh, Philip, thank you for your question again. But if I may add to that, Philip, you know, it, this was all taken on the premise of the health and safety at work order and the human rights. And, you know, like that is that is exactly what should have been done. I completely stand over it. And if I can maybe unpick for you uh, why the difference in terms of counsel. First of all, it was the, it was the, the standing down for a number of days 
of a, a new service. Um, I will say that there was little to no impact on delivery um, because uh, staff carried out documentation checks uh, up to the side. But what I will say to you is um, I have a very strong working relationship and, and you will know this, you're from this area and you will know that I have met with MLAs on many occasions and MPs and I have a very open relationship and throughout Corona, I, I provided you with reports uh, every week on what was going on. So I have a very open style of communication with my politicians and, and I think that's really, it's, it's, it's really powerful and um, I have a huge respect for them. And so I it was the day of a full council, it would have been very wrong let alone disrespectful of me not to have shared with them in the day of a council meeting when I have very, very high contact with all parties that uh, what was going on. So I, I think that was exactly the right thing to do. And in terms of going back, when I received, I, I have met with the group party leaders every day since that until we got the threat assessment. And I had um, I, I had said that I would share with them the threat assessment, but when I ha received a restriction document from the PSNI, I have no alternative but to get the staff back. The other thing is, during the week, politicians have made it a very, very high, highly uh, sensitive issue on radio and on, on, on media. So it was important for me to get those young staff back into their workplace smoothly and without any fuss. And I think we've achieved that. And I'm, I'm really glad they're back and I'm really glad they're happy and safe. So thank you for that, Philip. Okay, and just in fact, Chair, uh, I think it's important on my own behalf because uh, the Mayor uh, mentioned my name a couple of times, answering other members uh, and quoting me in relation to uh, raising community tensions. Just so that that uh, you know, I'm not uh, a victim like the trade unions uh, and, and being misquoted uh, or my information being embellished. When I talked about raising community tensions, I talked mm. about it in the context of two MPs and their comments, which were deliberately, in my view, designed to raise community tensions and also in the context of this decision by council. I mean, because the chief executive in her last answer just said it had little or no practical difference, but it had a major political difference. And that was the context in which I was talking about raising political tensions. I just don't want anybody out there to think that, uh, you know, that it was in any other context in which I was mentioning. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, right. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, okay. Let's take the opportunity, um, Anne and Chair. Our chair. Um, very, very briefly, uh, because we, we have been given a date there of the 3rd of February for a letter, which I believe was actually written on the 30th of January. But separate to that, and I think we need to be accurate about this, separate to that, I'd be very keen to hear as briefly as possible why the mayor doesn't think it's relevant for this committee and inquiry that we see a letter that refers to being compelled to take measures uh, around the issues that we're discussing here. So the letter, wow. the letter refers directly to that. So can I ask share? If it's in everyone's best interest, and I said at the start, and I meant every word of it, I'm trying to get here to, to the um, accountability and openness matters around this so that we all know exactly what we're talking about and the detail of what we're talking about. Therefore, could I suggest that we ask now, through you, Chair, to, to the Chief and the Mayor, um, that we see a copy of this letter and that every member of the committee be furnished with that letter and then everybody will know the full information. Yeah, and you know, John, for the, the avoidance of, of any doubt, you know, I, I, I've explained this fully um, already, but you know, I, I'm happy to, to reiterate the the point I was making is that the letter that you're referring to wasn't part of our decision making process, and this committee today is here to furnish the facts around the decision making process. So, um, as uh, your your colleague Philip McGuigan ha ha has mentioned. Uh, when, when, when we talk about this letter and why I feel if, if it's of no relevance, well, of course, if it's of no relevance. If I hadn't have seen it, if I if I didn't have it as part of the decision making process for me, then it's it's not um, of, of relevance to to the decision making process which this committee is is looking to to get answers to. So, I mean. I think that's clear. You're, as the chief executive has said, you're certainly welcome to, to ask for that letter. And, and, and you know, I just wanted to make the point that it did not form our decision-making process. 
Okay, can we, uh, can we make the um, committee, can, committee agree then to be right to request a copy of the letter? Okay. Yeah. Um, Patsy, a brief point you're looking there? Well, all the point now that has been covered by the action you've just agreed there, Chair, but all we're saying is that contents of that letter may have been reflected verbally to the council meeting and could have informed the decision making process. That's all the only point I want to. The, the letter, again, I haven't seen. There's been a lot of talk about it here today and the decision to request it. In, in Actually, I, I, I would just like to say that, that that's not the case. You have a full copy of the minute, which was uh, agreed by full council that uh, the conversation that happened in, in, in close council, you have a full copy of what was discussed. Mm. A full copy. Adam. Pardon? A verbatim minute. You have a minute of what was discussed, the way we it's take minutes. My question was, uh, well, it's not a verbatim minute, so it's not like concerts, therefore it doesn't reflect fully. That's my only point. Okay, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Chief Executive. Thank you. Okay, well, again, I want to just say as well, thanks very much, um, Anne, Anne, and uh, Alderman, uh, Sir, Sir Peter uh, Johnson. Thank you. For taking all the questions and giving very detailed and thorough answers, and we will be following up with a request for a copy of that letter, okay? So thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care now. Take good care. Take care now. Okay, remember, we're going to close session for a moment. Stella, can you confirm whenever we're off uh, spotlight or broadcasting? Can I, can I ask broadcasting to bring us into closed session to make sure all witnesses have left the spotlight and to bring staff in for broadcasting to confirm? Just so members know, the committee staff will be taking over this function from next week. Um, and it might just take us a wee while to be um, to get it all down pat. We're now in open, Philip. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're now back in the open session. So during the closed session, uh, the committee have agreed that we're going to rejig the uh, agenda a wee bit. So we're now going to take the evidence from uh, DERA staff on the horse racing bill, and then we will take the evidence from Mid and East Antrim SES uh, afterwards. So we're now going to go to item number seven, which is departmental oral evidence on the horse racing amendment bill and the outcome of the consultation and policy position uh, on that DERA bill. So can I refer members to the memo from the clerk on page 89 in your papers and from the department at page 94. And can I welcome then via Starleaf, uh, Clet McMaster, who is the Director of Sustainable Agri-Food Development and John Tarrington, Head of Agri-Food Brexit Policy. Uh, so can I invite the officials in to brief the committee, please? Hello, um, good morning. Um, can good morning. you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Colette McMaster. I'm joined online by John Terrington, I hope, um, who heads the bill team. Thank you for the opportunity to present today on the outcome of the department's consultation and the policy underpinning the horse racing amendment bill. The objective is to allow for the reinstatement of payments from the horse racing fund in support of Northern Ireland's two horse race courses as soon as is practicable. It's a short bill with a narrow scope. The bill will amend the Horse Racing Northern Ireland Order 1990, which is the legal basis for the Horse Racing Fund. The bill will amend the named beneficiaries to the fund to reflect a change in the operator at one of Northern Ireland's two horse race courses, so that the current operators of Down Royal Racecourse are eligible for support. Members will be aware that the bill was introduced to the Assembly on the 13th of April. As members have been provided with a background to the 1990 order and the fund, I'll not go through that in great detail at this point. But briefly, the 1990 order provides for the fund, which is intended to support horse racing at Northern Ireland's two race courses, Down Royal and Down Patrick. Bookmakers who are licensed under legislation that is the responsibility of the Department for Communities are required to pay into the fund, which is then to be dispersed to the beneficiaries named in the legislation. The support from the fund is to be used to assist in the operation and development of the two racecourses. As a result of a change in the operator at Down Royal in December 2018, payments ceased, as the new operator is not named in the legislation. Therefore, the bill is necessary in order to change the named operator at Down Royal so that payments can be reinstated. 
Members are aware that a consultation um, on the proposal to make such a change took place last year. While the consultation focused on that specific proposal, stakeholders were also invited to submit comments on the wider operation of the fund and support for horse racing in Northern Ireland more generally. Such comments will be invaluable in helping to shape a wider review of the fund. 11 responses were received and most were supportive of the proposal. Some respondents gave qualified support, for example, one suggested that the fund should also be opened out to others involved in horse racing, that is, other than Downpatrick and uh, Down Royal, and one suggested it should be extended to support greyhound racing. One key sector in particular did not agree with the proposal, which I'll come back to shortly. Papers on the outcome of the consultation have been shared with the committee, so again, I'll not discuss these in detail, but I will mention a few key issues, particularly where the proposal was questioned. Firstly, the off-course bookmakers were against the proposed amendment. They argued that it would be a departure from the policy intent of the 1990 order, which they believed related only to the operators that were named in the legislation at that time. Their concern stemmed from a view that as the new operator at Down Royal is part of a larger profit-making organisation, it should not be eligible for support under the fund. They raised concerns that public money could be used to supplement a profit-making organisation the former operator of Down Royal, the corporation, noted similar concerns, although they were generally supportive of payments being reinstated to Down Royal with adequate safeguards. The departments contend that a key aim of the 1990 order is to provide support for horse racing at the two named locations, and the bill will not change this. The department does not consider that being a profit making organisation to bar an organisation from accessing the fund, and there's nothing in the original legislation in this regard. As set out in committee's papers, the legislation already limits how the fund must be spent in support of horse racing at the two race courses. Bookmakers also commented that the fund would not comply with EU state aid rules. The department accepts the validity of this view and indeed in parallel was considering the implications of the EU state aid rules for the fund. Following the end of the transition period, EU rules no longer apply to the fund and therefore it was necessary that the department considered the implications of the new UK subsidy control regime, which came into force on the 1st of January. The department accepts that the fund represents a subsidy under these rules, as it has the potential to distort the market. The department's assessment is that it's not possible to make payments to Downpatrick Racecourse either at present, because to do so would create unfair competition in the market. To address this issue, it will be necessary to amend the 1990 order so that the fund is available to both Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland race courses. The bill will therefore allow for reinstatement of payments to both local horse race courses. As I mentioned earlier, comments were also received in the consultation on other issues beyond the scope of this bill. For example, some stakeholders ex highlighted the fact that online bookmakers do not contribute to the fund. I've already mentioned calls to extend the fund beyond the two current race courses and indeed for it to support greyhound racing. The licensing of bookmakers and gambling legislation is the responsibility of the Department for Communities, which is currently reviewing this matter following a consultation that ended early last year. However, we understand that there are no plans for legislative change in regard to issues such as remote gambling on, until the next mandate. It would therefore not be practical nor possible to make any major changes to the fund or to the 1990 order until the particular issue has been fully considered. We will work closely with DFC officials as they progress this work. We envisage that it will be necessary to consider the relationship between racing and the income generated from gambling and particularly online betting before any extension to online bookmakers can be formally considered. The department has already begun work to scope a wider review. As mentioned, comments that were received in the consultation will help shape such a review. And we will, of course, update the committee on this work in due course. Looking to the next steps, the bill will move to second stage. And following that, would stand referred to the committee for its committee stage. I wish to assure members of our commitment to working with the committee during the committee stage so that we can seek to secure the bill's passage as soon as is practicable within this mandate. We're happy to take questions and also, if helpful, to set out 
what each clause in the bill does. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colette, for that briefing. Uh, I'm just going to go straight now to members. A number have indicated uh, they want to ask a question. All right, you're first up. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair. Uh, Colette, thank you very much. I'm uh, just wondering, how does the way things are being done in the bill and overall compare to other jurisdictions, example, GB, Republic of Ireland, or anywhere else you may have looked at? Thank you. Um, well, we have uh, we each have our, our own arrangements in, in relation to um, supporting horse racing, and uh, um, the arrangements in in the Republic of Ireland and and, and, and GB um, have been reviewed more recently than here. Um, understand they're subject to review again, um, but uh, yes, there are arrangements in other in other jurisdictions um, reflect perhaps. More recent developments than our, our own arrangements might here, as I mentioned, even in, in terms of online gambling and so on. Um, but uh, I actually I see um, my colleague John on the uh, on the screen here, and I'm going to bring John in just on on in the video corner. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, I guess the biggest difference with uh, with GB um, is that it's um, administered by a non-departmental public body. Um, I guess that's one key difference. Uh, but the main difference um, that Clint has, has mentioned is uh, that it does include um, uh, income from from online or remote uh, bets, um, and then the levy is set at um, at a fixed rate, um, a ten percent of of profits, uh, whereas our levy um, uh, is 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 based on is is made or set through subordinate legislation under the nineteen ninety order, um, and is and is set by following consultation with um, the key players. That's the the bookmakers themselves and the. Um, uh, the, the 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 operators of of of, of the race courses, um, so a fundamental difference there, just in terms of how the actual levy is is is, is set. Uh, in in the uh, Republic of Ireland, um, uh, the horse and greyhound uh, racing fund is there's a fundamental difference there already, um, just in terms of its name, um, and and again uh, supports the the 24 race courses in in in, in the south. Um, it's again managed by by a non-public body, um, and it's it's used it uses funds raised from the the revenue through excise. Yep, that's spot on. Thank you for that. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Okay, hi, right, thank you. Uh, John John Blair. Madam Chair, thank you. And thank uh, John and Colette for the presentation and information given to us today. Um, I, want, I want to get into a bit more detail on this funding around the, the two main race courses versus a, a wider um, cross section of, of the sectors because. There's clearly uh, competition issues if in the south of Ireland, for example, that funding is being received from similar similar streams, and in Northern Ireland it isn't. Then, in a sport that would have a fair degree of cross-border elements and participation, it surely puts Northern Ireland at a disadvantage. And I suppose around that, I would like to ask in more detail. Why was it not considered to go more um, wide based on, on funding that's available to, to, for example, Greyhound Racing? Um, there's not evidence of the consideration of that or the decision reached in relation to that in the um, submission that we had before us. And apologies if it is there and I'm not picking it up, but I'd like to hear more about the reason and the rationale around that. Yes. Um, yes, John, thank you. Um, the, you're, you're right. It's not in this bill. Um, this, the intention, the aim of this bill, is to fix the operability of the fund, um, and, and that's simply what it's about. Um, as I said, it's narrow scope. Um, the position we're in at the moment is that we we are unable to make payments from the fund to either race course. So, um, and to to make that operability fix, we must change the legislation. So that both the current race courses are um, are named as beneficiaries and can therefore receive the, the money from the fund. So that that is the immediate priority. That's the immediate step, and that's what this bill is about. Um, which um, we hope to be able to um, 
bring through in this current mandate so that those payments can resume. We, we absolutely recognise that there are um, wider and complex issues to um, consider in terms of what the fund does and the scope of that fund and um, looking at the, the legislation which dates back to 1990. So um, matters such as uh, online gambling, um, online betting, um, or developments that have happened since then. Um, we absolutely need to look at that, um, but we need to, to do that in a considered way, and it would not be possible to um, introduce complex changes like that into uh, what is a very short and narrow um, bill during this, the remainder of this mandate. Um, but we know absolutely we, do, we need to do that. Um, the other question I think you, you mentioned was Greyhound Racing. Um, again, the scope of the 1990 order is horse racing. Um, that is, so it dates back to then, and that gives us that narrow scope. So greyhound racing, absolutely, that was one of the questions raised during the consultation. Um, and so it's something, as it was raised, that we've said we'll have, we will look at as part of a wider review. Um, so as to whether or not it would be appropriate to extend the scope of such a, of the horse racing fund to extend greyhound racing, um, yes, it's it's a matter from it is a matter to be explored, uh, and we will we'll have to take that take account of all the sort of issues and implications around that and in, in coming to a conclusion. Um, but that explains, I hope, why we can't do those major things now at this time. That uh, what we're doing now is sort of that immediate fix to be followed by a wider review. Yeah, yeah, Chair, th thanks for that. Thank you, Colette. I understand that you needed to do that fix and the, deal with the practicalities around this in, in a sort of very fine window. But is there at this point, given that these issues were raised in your in your consultation as well, um, is there a timeline or suggested timeline for the review that you mentioned? Well, we've, we've already started work on the review. So um, to start to scope out what that review would include, um, we we did we we asked for those comments those wider comments when we consulted because it's something we wanted to gather information on um to help inform what the scope of the review would be so absolutely um a number of issues that were raised during that we we will be looking at okay. um there we're, we're still in early stages of scoping out what the review is um but it uh it will include for example um we have made a we have made some start, but we need to do further work on this clearly. Um, but it will be the sort of things that have already been asked about this morning, um, including what are the, what are the arrangements in GB? What are the arrangements in the Republic of Ireland? Um, what is the the scope of the gambling um, uh, or the support to uh, to racing and uh, other other activities in those other jurisdictions? Um, it'll. It'll necessarily, it's a complex review, it'll uh, it will take some time, but we've made a start on it. So it is something we, we would see taking forward in the next mandate. Um, that's helpful. And is that likely to include the Greyhound racing element as well? Well, it's one of the issues was raised in the, in the consultation. So it's an issue that we will, we will look at. Okay. If, I, if, I, if I can say, sorry, John, um, I suppose it's worth saying that uh, the horse racing fund has been around a long time and, and, and clearly at the time there was a recognition that there was a connection between um, the potential loss of revenue from moving off course. Um, uh, and and I, 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 I can't second guess um, what the thinking was at the time that, that Greyhound wasn't. But one thing we've never done is to see if the, what the relationship, if any, between um, of course, betting um, uh, and and greyhound racing. Um, I, I've had the privilege of 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 of, of or the experience of being at, at one meet, and most of the the betting was obviously on course. But that doesn't say that certainly uh, the potential for for higher level, um, you know, uh, monies would would attract better, be, you know, uh, uh, a better event than an ergo. Um, uh, um, uh, have uh, have online betting or or off course betting, um, but that's a piece of piece of work that would need to to, to do um, to, to to ensure that or to be aware of what is the level of 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 relationship between uh, um, betting away from uh, a greyhound track and 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 the and the and the income um, accrued. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks both for that. Happy enough, John. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Thank you for your for your presentation. So, really, just clarification: this bill is just basically extreme and extremely narrow bill, and it's really for the sake of at the present time just changing changing the the names so that payments can be made. Yes, the owners. That's exactly what it is at the moment. Yeah. So you're to continue on. You're going to be looking at perhaps further changes to the horse racing bill, and you you spoke about uh, looking at online and off course betting and gambling, etc. Will you be taken into consideration in that bill when you look at it? The maybe the consequences of these this online and of course gambling okay i think um yes what, what we're uh set out maybe um just earlier in the in the in the opening words um we're aware that um obviously department for communities as well has responsibility yeah. For gambling, gambling legislation, and they're um, they're considering a review um, and, a, and a fairly wide review of that legislation, which is also has been in place for quite some time. So, um, what we would uh, anticipate is going, to, is going to be necessary is first to work closely with the Department for Communities, um, and there is there is some sort of crossover, and there are links between. And what we're talking about in, in terms of horse racing and support to that and the, the wider review, any wider review of gambling um, legislation. So um, there will there'll be things that aren't necessarily totally within the scope of what we do, but that we'll, we'll be seeking to working with colleagues in the Department for Communities um, so that what we're doing can be complementary or informed by, by, the other, um, by the other developments around wider gambling. Yeah, um, well, that's helpful. I don't know whether John. Yeah, anything. yeah, it, it, and maybe the Department of Health in relation to mental health issues, because we know, well, I know somebody, and I'm sure we all do, of people that have maybe overstepped their mark in gambling, and unfortunately, are not with us today. Um, Rosemary, had uh, uh, prompted me to speak. Yes, I mean the, the issues of. The regulation of gambling sits with the Department for Communities. Uh, they did consult, um, I think ending this time last year, uh, on a on a on a pretty um, wide ranging, albeit high level at that stage, um, uh, consultation on 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 reforming uh, gambling. It, it included um, matters of. Uh, um, uh, the, the 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 machines in shops and limits and things that have perhaps changed in 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 GB um, over the last three or four years, um, and it's our understanding that that they will seek to bring some um, uh, some changes uh, along along those lines uh, in the um, at least in the shorter term um, with a with a more wide review of the licensing um, of, of 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 bookmakers and so on, perhaps in in the in the longer term. So there are bits that. that are entirely in their gift and, and, and don't necessarily overlap with what we do and there are bits that perhaps in the longer term we as Glad said we'll have to, to work closely around the um uh the relationship between the two bits of the two bits of legislation um uh, and where and where and where they overlap. Thank you. Thanks. Okay Rosemary uh, Claire you're next Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks, Clinton John, as well. So um, this this fund is paid into then by, um, of course, bookmakers, not online and not on course, and I can see the rates yeah. that you're giving us in the pack there as well. Um, and it, that's meant to go up uh, according to the rate of inflation annually as well. Those rates, can I ask how much is in the fund currently? Yeah. Um, I just, just um, Claire, I think um, the on course bookmakers pay into the fund as well as the off course currently. I'll just clarify, clarify that. Um, but yes, there's there, the levy um, income, the levy collected annually is, is in the region of around £350,000. Um, and uh, the 
that rate has um, really, I think, the last sort of increase to that rate was, um, I think, dates back to 2010. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the rate, so it's not, it's not a, it's not set as an inflation increase, um, Claire. At the moment, it's it's the legislation um, says that the rate is increased by agreement between the rate is set up by agreement between the uh, horse race horse operators and the bookmakers, um, and uh, that was the the last time that was actually was an agreement to increase it, um, that was reflected in the legislation. There there was a, a consultation back in 2017 with a view to increasing the rate again. Um, and uh, but that, that actually didn't actually make it into legislation at the time, and um, because uh, at that time the assembly then was wasn't actually functioning. So it hasn't increased at this stage. This this bill isn't looking at that, that aspect. Um, um, the order itself provides for uh, the rates to be increased by subordinate legislation to the affirmative resolution of the assembly. That is separate from this one. Um, you asked how much we fund currently, so um, because we haven't been making payments out since the end of 2018, um, there's around £680,000 in the fund currently. And then, can I ask you, who makes the decisions then about where those funds are distributed? The, the funds are paid um, to the two ben named, well, named beneficiaries in the legislation. So, um, and the, the funds are paid by on the basis of um, business plan that the researchers have for their for use of the funds basically, um, and they're paid out for specific specific reasons. Um, the use of the fund is, is uh, defined how it can be used and defined in the in the 1990 order. Um, and I'm just going to see, yeah, the, the purposes for which it can be used is at the two locations is prize money to provide or improve technical or other services with respect to the operation of racing and safety of spectators conducted racing. Great. And is that, um, is that overseen by a board or is that a departmental decision or who, who looks at the business plans and um, works that out? And um, the they fund is administered by the department. Okay. Yeah, John, I think were you seeking come in there? No, no, that was just going to say the same thing. Yes, they they every every year the um the the, the operators are required to, to to put in their um their their, their business plan um and the department um considers uh with with reference to the amount of money in the fund um. Uh, the 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 appropriability of 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 of, of what, what the requests are uh, in line with what what Coletus was Coletus has set out. Um, mm -hmm. And so, is there any plans to increase the levy that you know of? I, there are no plans to increase the levy at this okay. stage. Um, and I think we we have we have as, as, I, as I've mentioned there because we haven't paid out from the funds. There actually is um, about six hundred eighty thousand pounds in that fund currently. So we're not. There aren't plans to to increase the level. That's just maybe one last one. Are you aware of any um, potential further development of new race courses happening or being um, scoped out? I mean, there, maybe bring John in on this. There, there, there could potentially. I mean. There, there are only the two current race courses here um, in Northern Ireland. Um, as you're, you're aware, there could be in the future other race courses potentially. Um, I'm not well. I'll bring John in there on that. Uh, there, there, there has been some discussion of multi-use. I think at um, Giants Park, the the old foreshore, Belfast foreshore, as one of many possible uh, projects. Um, I think. Um, uh, but but obviously it's 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 it would take some time to develop and, and I suppose we would be hopeful that um, we'll have moved from what, what what we have now to to something something new or different um, at, at the end of review before that would be up and running if it if it if if it if it ever if it ever does. Potential development at the Jams Park. That's my understanding. 
Right, thank you. But as I say, it's one of those things, one of one of those many things that, that that's been, I think, muted the possibility of use of that of that land. Thanks very much for that. Cheers. Okay, uh, Morris. 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 Right, chair. Right. Uh, Go ahead. Nice to see you. Good to see you back. <laughs> thank you, Morris. Just a point point of clarification, really, Chair. Uh, look, that this whole gambling carry on is alien to me because I, I have never gambled and know nothing about gambling. Uh, but as I understand, the sole purpose of this amendment bill is to create a level playing field in relation to our two, two race courses. However, if I pick this up correctly, following the outworking of this amendment bill, that would then allow the Department of Communities to be in a position to carry out a full review. Uh, it could include online gambling, machines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to get that review started, we need to get this amendment bill over the line. Is, am, am I reading this right? Because I know absolutely nothing about purchases or anything else like that. Um, yes, Morris. Um, the this this bill is to amend um, the the horse racing the nineteen ninety order, which is legislation that's the responsibility of DARA. Yeah. Um. um Separately, um, Department for Communities have responsibility for gambling legislation. Um, so I suppose we, we did mention what, what is happening is, um, from our point of view, horse racing, we, we see this bill, this short bill, as necessary, as, as you noted, um, to fix the operability of our current fund. Um, and we, we then do see there's a need to um, do a wider review of the 1990 order, the horse racing order. Um, Department for Communities are separately um, considering their gambling legislation, mm -hmm. um, which is also um, of quite of some age. I think it, it, it may be um, 35 years old, um, while ours is around 30. That's that sort of ballpark. Um, so I'm aware that they're, we're aware they're considering a, a wider review of the gambling legislation. So what we're talking about is two separate pieces of legislation, mm -hmm. but there, there are areas which are of common interest between the two. So um, in, in terms of the two departments um, doing wider reviews of their legislation, uh, we'll, we'll want to work closely with them. If I may say, Morris, thank you again for the question. I mean, to, to, I think Colette did say it in her, in her introduction, but what, what the specific relationship is uh, as far as this le legislation is concerned is that it is a licensed bookmaker Mm -hmm. that is required to pay into the fund uh, that license is a is a a a, 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 a department for communities um license uh, under under its gambling legislation um uh, and, and therefore anybody raising the issue or any potential um to expand uh, who might feed into um uh might, might pay into the fund is out Outside our gift, in the sense that it is a license. So until and if they reviewed um, uh, uh, the definition of a licensed bookmaker in Northern Ireland, um, that there's nothing we would be able to do as far as is concerned. Uh, if they are to do that, and if they are to change licensing rules, well then that the, the, we 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 would need to work with them to to ensure that it still fits um, any future fund or, or or any review of the fund go, 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 go going forward. Um, they at the same time, by the way, a license um, a an applicant or somebody applying for its annual license is required to prove that it is paid into the levy. So the, so the relationship is, um, is, 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 is two way, but that's, that's what the limit of the, of the actual, uh, um, uh, relationship is between the two bits of legislation. Okay. Chairman, thank you very much. And I appreciate the, the, the answer that kind of cleared up for me as, uh, somebody that knows absolutely nothing about the sport, but thank you. Anyway, thank you. You'll, you'll be an expert, Morris, by the time the, this legislation oh. I, I doubt it very much, Chair. <laughs> um, sorry, members, I, I just had, was momentarily popped out there. But maybe the, maybe the question has been asked about the levy. Does this apply um, solely to the horse creation, or has the Greyhound tracks been included, or should they be included in this as well? Maybe that's been covered. Yes, yes. Um, this, this levy um, is 
uh, this levy, the fund, this levy goes into the fund, the levy is paid by the, the licensed bookmakers into this horse racing fund and the fund is used to support um, the operation of the two horse race courses in Northern Ireland. So this uh, 1990 legislation on horse racing, the horse racing order, does not, the scope of it does not include greyhound racing. Yeah. And uh, so currently, no, greyhound racing is not supported by, uh, by this levy. It doesn't come under this legislation. Um, one of the questions we did get in the consultation um, that we carried out, one of the, uh, the suggestions was that um, we should consider whether or not to um, we should extend the support for horse racing to include greyhound racing. Um, it, it's one of those um, issues that will uh, would be part of a wider review. Um, it's not part of what we're doing in this immediate in this immediate bill during this mandate, um, but it is one of the issues that uh, would be in the scope of a wider review of the horse racing fund that we would uh, we would intend to carry out over over a longer term than this bill. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, uh, like Morris, I wouldn't be uh, particularly expert in these matters, but the, the the principle of the levy and the fund, I can't understand why it wouldn't be the case that uh, the greyhound track providers couldn't be able to access it on the same basis. Jared, I sorry, Colette. I, I said earlier when this this did did come up. Um, I mean, since nineteen seventy six, when this legislation was first and then updated again in nineteen ninety, the the relationship between the loss of um, potential income when bets were allowed to be taken off course was made at that time. Um, I guess one of the things that we would need to do is see what level or amount of relationship there is between bets taken off the um, off. Uh, Away from greyhound racing um, on the on those on those races, it's just something we've we've never we've never never looked at, and we and would take would take to look at it before you could before you could consider. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it is the case, but it may be that um, the, potentially that uh, one of the reasons why you wouldn't extend it is because there isn't any um, bets taken on on greyhound racing um, away from the course. Uh, there, 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 there no doubt is, but um, I don't think we, we you, you would need to be on your sure ground before you would before 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 you do that. And obviously what level that is before yeah. you could ever be able to consider how you might set a levy um, that, that, that would support um, uh, greyhound racing. Yeah, well, that's OK. I'm sure that'll be considered in the way to review it anyway. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, I want to thank you very much, uh, Colette and John, for uh, attending. We're, we're in the afternoon now, so we're attending this, this morning afternoon session. And uh, I want to thank you very much. And obviously, this will become before the uh, us for the Chamber on Monday. So thank you very much, John and Colette. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care now. Bye-bye. Um, OK, members, um, we're going to move back now to item number six. Um, Stella, can you keep me right? This is the oral evidence session. Um, uh, with AC, yes, yes. yes. Um, yeah, you just need to call the two witnesses from the audience into the spotlight. Yes, okay. Members, we're going to have now an oral evidence session from Mid and East Antrim Borough Council Shared uh, Environmental Services. I uh, could ask for the witnesses to be brought into the spotlight, please. I want to refer members to the memo at page 78 and the briefing papers from Shared Environmental Services at page 83. And I want to now welcome by uh, Starleaf, uh, Nicola Rose, the Director of Development, and Paul Duffy, Head of Planning. And I'd like to invite uh, both uh, Nicola and Paul to uh, brief the committee, and then members will um, uh, ask some questions. So thank you, Nicola and Paul. You appear to be on mute. Um, you may be muted there, Nicola and Paul. Just to encourage and encountering a few technical difficulties here whilst we get unmuted. OK. 
Okay. Okay, um, we're having a few technical difficulties here. Um, Stella, is it possible to, oh, Nicola? They should be unmuted now. Nicola and Paul, can you hear us? No, you, no. you're not unmuted, we, we can't hear you. Broadcasting, they're still on mute. Can I ask that maybe if you can hear me, Nicola and Paul, if you could maybe try leaving the meeting and coming back in? Okay. Oh, I heard you there. Did you hear us? Can you hear us now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. So now we can't see you. We can't see you. Hold on a wee second. Yes. Do you want me to do? Oh, you see. Hold on a second. Launch now. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Oh, that should be us now. There's nothing happening. Okay, we're going to wait through these. Well, we appear to have lost the witnesses. So, um, oh, Stella, does that? Um, that that's yes. back now. Yeah. Okay, you can you can restart the session then, Declan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nicola and Paul. Um, if you want to uh, take this opportunity, maybe to, to brief the committee and members will then ask a number of questions after that. Perfect. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, Good I'm day. delighted to be You hear me okay now? 100%. I'm, I'm delighted to be here before the committee this morning. Um, it's this afternoon, so um, apologies for that. To provide you all with an overview of shared environmental services, I'm Nicola Rose, Director of Development, and accompanying me here today is Paul Duffy, our Head of Planning and Building Control, who has direct responsibility for shared environmental services. First, I'd like to provide you with an overview of the role and remit of shared environmental services that will offer some background to the service and also hopefully clarify or position and any misconceptions that they may be. I suppose our Chief Executive Fallen RPA took on the role of hosting shared environmental services in 2015. SES is a shared service between the 11 councils. It was established to support councils across NI to carry out their habitats regulations assessments for their planning functions. The service sits within the Development Directorate portfolio in Midney Stantrum Borough Council and is under direct management of our Head of Planning and Building Control, Paul who is he is here today. Currently, we have 10 staff employed in the service with expertise in environmental assessment and ecology. The service was initially staffed by elective transfer from NIEA, and they brought a wealth of substantial experience and knowledge. Vacancies are filled by public recruitment, and applicants must have the relevant degree, qualifications, experience, and membership of professional bodies. SES, it's important to note this morning, SES does not have a statutory or formal decision-making role or powers. The remit is to provide sound guidance and specialist support to allow councils to meet their statutory responsibilities as competent authorities under the Habitats regulations. And I think that's important to note. This work is carried out under the terms of a service level agreement with each council. Feedback from councils up to this point has been extremely positive, and we really do pride ourselves in the quality, professionalism and efficiency of the service. We are funded through the Department for Communities Transfers Function Grant, and this grant is uplifted by a rate equivalent to councils' rate increase each year. The volume of work has substantially higher than what was anticipated when SES was first established. It's important to note, I suppose, when we set it into the context, NEA 
was previously responsible for HRAs and received about 750 consultations per year from planning services. SES was resourced on that basis. I suppose SES, however, has received over 2,000 consultations per year from councils. This demand has therefore been more than, you could say, three times the volume of SES that it was resourced for back in 2015. The increase in the workload is because planners are becoming more aware of the importance of protecting European sites and of the risk of legal challenges without doing their due diligence in regards to assessment and the impacts that they might have. The Chief Executive, both bearing this in mind, we, we aspired or we really did need to look at how do we resource up to meet the demand that was key for us and critical. The Chief Executive formally wrote to the Department for Communities to put forward a case for an increase in the transfers function grant or a revisit of the grant awarded. This was um, turned down by the Department for Communities as they didn't feel that they had the capacity or ability to increase the transfers function grant. So failing the approach with the Department for Communities, the Chief Executive wrote to the Department for Infrastructure to put forward the case. It was also the request was turned down. So having that in mind, I suppose the next stop was Solus. So our Chief Executive through Solus put the case to councils in 2020, seeking an additional funding of 8.5k per year for two years to allow ASS to, I suppose, be adequately resourced to meet the additional pressures on the service. The additional funding request was approved, so this allowed SES to credit an additional two members to the team. I suppose this additional resource will allow the service to become a lot more agile, meet the demands, and also ramp up and be that supportive ear for our local councils when they're faced with extremely complex cases. I'm going to now pass over to Paul Duffy, our Head of Planning and Building Control, is going to take you through the operational delivery and complexities faced by SES in more detail. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, the requirements for uh, habitat regulations assessment, assessments are set out in the Habitats uh, Regulations. Council's planning authorities are responsible for carrying out appropriate assessments under the regulations and planning applications where development is likely to have a significant impact on a European designated site in Northern Ireland. The term European site is retained following the end of the EU transition and refers to special areas of conservation and special protected areas, and only the most significant and important areas in Northern Ireland are granted these designations. SES is consultant in planning applications which affect European sites. When undertaking an appropriate assessment, the Council must consult with DERA and have regard to any representations made by it through NIEA. The advice provided by NIEA informs the assessment undertaken by SES. Therefore, the work that SES carries out on behalf of councils is complementary to, rather than duplicating, the role of the department as a statutory consultee. On completion of the HRA, SES issues a response to the relevant council. It's a matter for the individual council, as the competent authority, to review the assessment and adopt it. From the establishment of SES to the end of 2020, SES have responded to consultations on over 6,000 planning applications. In the vast majority of cases, approximately 99%, it has advised that the application met the requirements of the regulations. SES has no formal decision-making responsibility. Rather, it exists to provide informed advice to councils who retain the ultimate decision-making authority, both as the planning authority and the competent authority for the purposes of the Habitats regulations. European sites are distributed throughout Northern Ireland. It's therefore inevitable that there may be effects on these sites from agricultural development. Ammonia levels at the vast majority of the designated sites in Northern Ireland exceed the levels at which significant damage occurs. DERA currently implement an operational protocol whereby projects which can demonstrate that the process contribution of ammonia is less than 1% of the critical levels at European sites are deemed acceptable. DERA has accepted for well over two years that its operational protocol does not necessarily meet with the requirements of the habitat regulations. In July 2019, SES shared their internal guidance on how it assesses ammonia emitting projects. In preparing this guidance, SES was influenced 
a recent case law in the Netherlands which found that threshold levels for ammonia which were being treated as insignificant were contrary to the Habitats Directive. The levels been treated as insignificant in the Netherlands uh, were considerably lower than the equivalent being applied in Northern Ireland. SAS was also influenced by the fact that DERA had previously advised that the critical levels of ammonia at which ecological damage occurs have already been exceeded at 98% of Northern Ireland's special areas of conservation. In October, um, the internal guidance indicated the SAS would further assess applications uh, with process contributions greater than 0.1% of critical levels. In October 19, or 2019, uh, the Ulster Farmers Union sought leave for a judicial review of SAS's internal guidance. The legal challenge arose from the Ulster Farmers Union perceiving that SAS had unlawfully adopted a new and more stringent threshold. However, SAS did not set a threshold for ammonia emissions, but rather the guidance provided a trigger for further assessment. The guidance was considered necessary uh, to provide clarity on how SAS would assess ammonia emitting projects. The application for leave to apply for, ju for judicial review was resolved by mutual agreement in March 2020 and involved SAS withdrawing its guidance pending the outcome of an ongoing review by DERA of its operational protocol for assessing ammonia emitting projects. At this time, the Chief Executive of NIA indicated that the updated protocol would be issued for public consultation in a matter of weeks. In the, mean, in the meantime, SAS agreed to assess each ammonia emitting project on its merits. Where no adverse effect can be determined, responses to that effect were issued. Where issues arise, they have been referred to DERA in its role as the statutory nature conservation body for Northern Ireland. Planning policy makes it clear the planning permission should only be granted for projects which will not have an adverse effect on protected sites. The habitats regulations require councils to take a precautionary approach, with the legal test being beyond reasonable scientific doubt that the proposal will not have a lasting adverse effect. Cordera indicate that a, that a proposal meets their operational protocol, but SAS cannot determine that there will be no adverse effect on site integrity or where there is reasonable scientific doubt as to this, SES advised councils to consult NIA on the draft appropriate assessment and ask NIA in their role as a statutory nature conservation body to advise whether it agrees with the findings of the draft assessment. Since April 2020, DERA has now been consulted on 24 such applications and to date DERA has not responded on any of these outstanding yeah. consultations. Um, I'll pass back now to uh, Nicola to finish the presentation. Thanks, Paul, for the overview. So with that in mind, we've been sitting now nearly a year with these 24 cases sitting with DERA with no further decisions made on them or no further consultation, and also we're still awaiting an operational protocol. Our Chief Exec Executive felt it was critical at this point that we engage with DERA to get a sense of the time frame in regards to processing the outstanding applications and also a specific date for the operation of the new operational protocol and ammonia strategy. Our Chief Executive met with Minister Putz last summer to discuss the challenges SES is facing when assessing intensive agricultural cases. At this time, SES had a backlog of approximately 80 cases. At that meeting, our Chief Executive gave a commitment to Minister Pitts that SES would clear the backlog within 12 weeks, which we have done on the basis that the new protocol will come into play and the consultation will be out. The Chief Executive regularly engaged with Minister Pitts to provide him with an update on progress in regards to the clearing of the backlog. Any ongoing delays in the processing of applications are due to the failure of DERA in, in, to respond to the 24 that have been consulted on. Chief Executive formally wrote again to Minister Putz on the 24th of November 2020, seeking clarity on when would the respective councils receive a decision on the outstanding applications and requesting an update on the new operational protocol in ammonia as part of the wider strategy. We were informed that this would happen and commence in early autumn 2020 and we're still in the same position. 
at the on the fourth of December, SES received an update from DERA advising that the work on the draft Northern Ireland ammonia strategy was in its final stages and would be complete by the end of the year and issued for public consultation. We are still no further forward with that. And again, the Chief Executive formally wrote to Minister Lyons on the 18th of February 2021, once again, to request an update on the operational protocol and the outstanding cases. We are still awaiting um, a response on the outstanding cases. So you can see how, I suppose, councils waiting for a decision or further support are beginning to become frustrated. And we are becoming frustrated in terms of not having a new or see the final stages of the draft protocol. To date, DERA still have not published the draft ammonia strategy. DERA continues to base consultation responses on the outdated operational protocol. This is causing great uncertainty in the planning process and leading to delays in the applications affected. I suppose from our point of view, we really do look forward to learning the outcome of DERA's review of the operational protocol and the launch of consultation of NA ammonia strategy. I think it's really important that a pragmatic approach is taken to supporting the agri sector. For us, I know Mid East Antrim, it's viewed as a priority growth sector and an emerging sector with growth potential to create high value jobs and stimulate economic growth. And that's key for us that we want to we want to work in partnership. We would welcome more detailed information on the sensitivity of European sites and capacity for development around them, as well as advice on the efficiency and environmental impacts and new technologies and approaches to the reduction of ammonia. When DERA issues its up, uh, updated approach, SES hopes to be able to adopt and apply it uh, with a similar approach to the appropriate assessments for planning applications. In the meantime, in the absence of an updated approach, we will assess applications on the information and evidence available to support councils to make decisions that are fair and consistent while complying with the regulations. This brings our oral evidence to an end. Um, I hope you found it um, informative this morning, and we are now happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for that, Nicola and Paul, for that uh, very detailed uh, briefing and for the, the written um, briefing that you also provided it and provided it to us in advance of the meeting. Um, I suppose what I will say, if a number of members here want to ask questions, um, what I will say is, can you, uh, um, I suppose, the... You know, um, appreciate certainly from an applicant's point of view, where where they where they where they see that you have the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and you also have SES, and I know even from making representation on behalf of applicants for various local applications, even for 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 residential um, houses, and I'm going to say that there seems to be like a a tech hacking that is going on between council, SES, NIEA, and sometimes. Uh, it become it can become very confusing and frustrating. Can can you um can you, do you appreciate that there? You know, and how can how can that be become more efficient or or um you know can you understand how, how that can result in delays and confusion for people? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate um, um both um, NAA and SAS have different roles in uh, the process um. NAA's role or SES's role in uh, the planning process is very narrow and it is limited um, to ensuring the proposed developments comply with uh, the legal requirements of the habitats regulations. Um, and ultimately, um, the legal position and uh, the, the scientific uh, evidence that is available uh, would indicate that um, the operational protocol which um, NIA are continuing to um, operate isn't compliant with the habitats uh, regulations. And I suppose that's where the problem lies. And it is uh, this tension between DERA's operational protocol and the legal and scientific position. And SES have to provide um, objective advice, scientific advice to councils as to whether or not they're compliant with uh, the regulations. And NAA have acknowledged that their um, operational protocol is outdated and they have been undertaking a review. And until such times as that review is concluded and uh, the ammonia strategy and operational protocol that DERA are bringing forward is actually um, available to us 
the situation remains unsatisfactory because there is that uh, tension between the two. And the sooner that matter is uh, resolved and that we can take a consistent approach, the better. And whilst that um, tension, as I've referred to, um, remains, it, it will still be um, that clarity is not there, and, and that's where the confusion is arising from. Um, and just before we move around, to see in relation then to the not point one percent, um, you know, when that whenever that was introduced, basically what, what that created, and especially you no, know, I live in the west, in the west here, where where there is a, a fair few SACs and ASSAs, basically that there. Um, uh, it more or less just put a put a block on any 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 uh, development at all in relation to agriculture, and you know, even had a um, situation where farmers couldn't replace like with like. You know, they couldn't even replace sheds or, or, or infrastructure with even other infrastructure that may be more efficient, uh, because of the not point one uh, the not point one percent. So you do have this contradiction. Between uh, one hand, quite correctly wanting to protect our our natural habitats, but on the other hand, the requirement to produce food. Um, so, uh, can you understand? So, see that there was not point one percent. Did did you con consult on that? Uh, introduce that not point one percent a more more stringent threshold. Um, well, first of all, um, I think there's a misconception that the, the not point one percent brought a halt to uh, the vast majority of agricultural um, activity or planning applications. It didn't, um, and I made the point of uh, stressing that um, over approximately ninety nine percent of uh, planning applications that SAS undertook um, were approved, and currently there are the twenty four applications which. Um, myself and Nicola referred to that are uh, sitting with DERA. So we're actually talking about very, very small numbers. And I think that needs to be put into uh, the context. And the other thing is that um, the 0.1% wasn't a threshold. It was a trigger whereabouts SCS would require um, further assessment. It wasn't that anything um, above this 0.1% was unacceptable. It was a trigger whereabouts further assessment would be carried out and in that instance, uh, in our own council, there were eight uh, applications to fail within that uh, what you call threshold between the one percent and the not point one percent. And of those um, eight, uh, were about initially SAS had concerns. Three were subsequently approved. One was refused, and uh, the uh, remaining uh, ones are uh, with uh, NIA at the minute. So I think, you know, whenever you look at the reality, the reality out there, and there has been a misconception that that 0.1%, um, you know, put a halt to agricultural development, it didn't. And then uh, your further question was, uh, was that there uh, consulted on? And uh, SAS um, are not a decision-making body. They do not produce policy and they do not um, uh, produce legislation. That's a matter for, um, you know, government to do. And uh, therefore, uh, their internal guidance uh, was uh, the interpretation of legislation, and it didn't constitute um, either a new legislative provision uh, or new policy. Um, and therefore, in that context, it was not considered that public consultation was necessary. Um, Indeed, if public consultation could have been construed as misleading, uh, because it would have implied that uh, there were a new policy or legislative changes which were being consulted on, which would have been, un been inaccurate. So therefore, it wouldn't have been, because SAS were not responsible for making decisions on policy or legislation, it was only guidance on how they were undertaking an assessment that wasn't consulted on. Mm. Okay. Um Thanks for that. And, and, and just before I move around then, so who, who like who are you uh, accountable? Who is SES accountable to, uh, Paul? Well, ultimately, SES is accountable to each of the eleven councils. Um, it is a shared service. Um, they provide the councils with um, their expert scientific uh, advice. They try to provide as objective advice as possible. The, it's therefore a matter for the decision maker, which is the individual planning authorities, each of the councils, to decide what weight they want to attach to SES's weight or SES's uh, advice. SES's 
advice is one of a number of material considerations which the planning authority will have to uh, take into consideration when uh, they're making a decision and in some instances they may decide to set that aside and, and for example you raised the um, example uh, of where um, a farm is looking to introduce new development but SES maybe still had a, a concern with that and um, I suppose uh, what you have to appreciate is, is that an, a, a lot of these protected sites um, have said 98 percent of uh, special conservation areas, the background levels of ammonia where damage, significant damage occurs, is already exceeded at them particular sites. So therefore, where the uh, conservation status of the habitat is already unfavourable, it's very difficult to um, introduce an activity that's going to generate further ammonia. Now, where there is an existing facility, um, if the ammonia that it's generating is already brought in, you know, it, it has already been calculated in the background uh, ammonia levels, and therefore they're proposing a replacement system which is going to reduce that, well then the net reduction can be taken into consideration and will be a material consideration in making a decision on that. But if the background levels are already um, highly exceeded um, and even the new technology might not be enough to bring that down to below what would be uh, the um, levels for about snow damage is being uh, provided. SES needs to let that council know that okay that, that it is reducing the background levels but it's still not bringing them down below uh, the levels uh, required under the year you know, under the Habitats Directive, and therefore it would be a matter for that individual council to say, well, look, you know, the fallback position if we don't approve this here is that the situation is going to be worse. But if we approve it, we actually get a uh, an improvement to the situation, even though it's still not complying with the, the Habitats Directive. And they may decide because they're the decision maker. So ultimately, it is up to the individual councils. All SES is doing is providing them with the best possible advice they can do to enable that council to make an informed decision on the application and it may be that, that there is a reason that they decide in this instance you know although it is still contrary to the re regulations it actually improves the situation and if we continue improving the situation we will gradually get the levels down so you know that there i think would be you know a valid reason for a council to possibly um look at SES as advice and decide well you know we um are going to, uh, you know, we've considered it, um, but we're not going to attach the turning weight to it. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, we'll move around here, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and can I thank you for your presentation? Um, I want to touch on similar to what the chairman's already said, and it is bizarre in some circumstances where a farmer uh, wants to do a new build and, and reduce emissions that he's not allowed to do so, and I think that is an issue. You did say under the uh, challenge by the Ulster Farmers Union that you withdrew your guidance. Uh, you agreed to withdraw your guidance. If you agreed to withdraw your guidance, did that guidance not revert back to what the original guidance was then? Um, I suppose... Um... Why not? Well, ultimately, SES has to provide um, sound uh, guidance to councils which comply with the habitats uh, regulations. And uh, NEA have now for over two years um, publicly acknowledged that their operational protocol does not comply with the um, habitats regulations. So therefore, if in every situation, SES continued to apply uh, DERA's operational protocol. It wouldn't be um, doing its role, which is to ensure that uh, you know it, it advises planning or planning authorities for their planning applications are contrary to the regulations or not. So therefore, that's why the current operational protocol being um, 
operated by uh, DERA, it is out of date. They are currently reviewing it. Um, every time we ask, we're told that uh, you know it's in its final stages and it will be uh, published. Um, you know, we were told that it would be published um, in, in, in the autumn last year. We were told then it would be published before the end of the year. Then we were told that it would be published in the spring. And this cycle keeps going on. And, you know, in, in, in the meantime, um, planning decisions still have to be made. And although we uh, do not, um, you know, we haven't reverted back to the guidance, but we have to just look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis and make a, a decision on best informed, you know, the best informed decision we can. But you clearly withdrew your guidance. You didn't feel confident in going into court with, gu with the guidance you had, so you withdrew that guidance. Uh, um, and left quite a number of farmers in limbo. No, uh, the guidance was withdrawn because at that time we were given a commitment by the Chief Executive and NIA that uh, the updated operational protocol would be uh, published in yeah. uh, four to six weeks. Um, so there was that there. There's also, um, whenever you know that uh, the situation is being updated, um, decisions have to be made as to whether or not going into a judicial review, which was it's going to be complex, it's going to be uh, use a lot of public money to uh, defend. Um, it, it is quite a specialist area. It is quite complex. Um, whether or not that's the best use of public money. And in, in the... The reassurance that we had been given with uh, NIEA that their uh, policy was um, going to be published um, in a matter of weeks, and the fact that uh, we knew that any um, judicial review would be running into the hundreds of thousands of uh, public money, I, I think the correct decision was to reach agreement with the Ulster Farmers Union um, and, and not to proceed, and, and that's what we did. For the one looking in from the outside, they would, they would say that you weren't confident in the guidance that you'd given, or you would have been quite happy to go to the court because that would have been the Farmers Union problem if they had been wrong. But uh, if you were confident in what you had, uh, I, I have uh, one particular farm, and they're sitting uh, in their application, their emissions are 0.3%, and I think your guidance is 0.1%. So this guy is sitting in limbo because he's at 0.3%, which is, which is very low. Uh, and yeah. He's still sitting in the for maybe a year and a half or two years. Well, the, the, I don't know the details of that, and I wouldn't want to get into a specific case, but any SAS are turning around uh, consultations in a matter of weeks, and if that application is sitting in limbo, it is not with SAS, it is with NIEA. The NIEA was happy with it, and they went to use you send it back to them. That's a requirement on the regulations. Uh, NAA is the the nature uh, the statutory nature conservation uh, body in Northern Ireland. They're, they're a statutory consultee in the planning process, and the regulations require us uh, to consult with them. So SAS will have undertaken the appropriate assessment. Uh, their findings will have been that they could not be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt, and therefore the legislation requires them to reconsult with NAEA. And uh, there are twenty four applications which. Um, we have, uh, I mentioned, have been sitting with uh, NIA now for some of them over a year, and uh, they haven't responded uh, to them. And uh, in uh, these instances, you know, we have been pushing for, you know, on behalf of the eleven councils, for NIA to respond to the consultations. Uh, they are a statutory consult. They, they have a legal requirement to consult, and they should be providing a uh, response within uh, 21 days. And at the minute, uh, what NAA are advising councils is that uh, in the absence uh, of a comment, no inference uh, can be made on uh, DERA's position uh, with regard to other environmental matters. It is the responsibility of the planning authority to ensure that all risks of the environment and uh, requirements under environmental and planning policy have been considered. Now, ultimately, that's the whole point that we consult with um, NIEA is to, um, because they are the statutory nature conservation body, it is their role uh, to advise on these matters. And, and whenever they don't, um, it, whenever they're not responding, it, it's leaving councils in a very difficult position because you know they can't make an informed decision without their consultation response back. 
Yeah, that, okay. It just seems strange that you blame them and they blame you. Okay. Thank well, you. I suppose, yeah. I, I suppose, William, that's why we're here today to hopefully clarify. You know, we don't have any decision making powers and we, we're, 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 we're waiting patiently on the, the new protocol and the, the new strategy. And hopefully that'll allow us all to move forward. And those 24 that are currently sitting there will be pushed through the process and hopefully um, they'll get a decision on that. Hopefully, hopefully that works out sooner rather than later. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, um, Rosemary. Thank you, very much. Thank you for your presentation. Again, like the previous two speakers, I would have reservations in relation to some of the work that's been carried out. I actually, if it lightly, can I say, it just appears to be as if you're another tier of bureaucracy that pl that application to planning have to jump through. And that, that gives me concern because again, I represent the West, I'm from Anna, and I know of a number of applications that have been held up with this, held up again because a number of applications in relation that have been held up. So, however, I want to ask you, how much consultation have you done with the with the um, the representatives of the people that are the representatives of those that are putting in planning applications? You know the agents that represent the the applicants. How much consultation have you done with them and open meetings and briefings and things like that, so that they're aware of your role and what you what you require to what and that's the first thing. And the second thing is, how open are you to applicants phoning you up and saying, well, look, what's the problem here? How can we resolve it? How can we resolve it sensibly, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, well, first and foremost, we um, are, are happy to meet with uh, any agents. Um, we met with, uh, for example, the Ulster Farmers Union, and we fully explained to them uh, in advance what our internal guidance was, how we uh, assessed applications, and we have met with uh, probably most of uh, the agents out there uh, that uh, would be responsible for submitting planning applications on intensive uh, livestock and uh, the likes of anaerobic digesters, and we have gone through the process with them. So um, we try to be as uh, helpful and open as possible. Um, and, you know, with regard to the likes of, if, if there is a, an application and there are mitigation measures which could possibly, in, in the likes of if the ammonia levels are exceeded, that could significantly reduce them, we're happy to take that into account in the assessment, let that be built into their model. And um, But ultimately, um, DERA has a responsibility uh, for agriculture and they should be providing advice on what are the mitigation measures which uh, farmers can introduce to um, reduce ammonia? And that's why we would welcome the ammonia strategy, which it should be taking a holistic role about how we can manage and reduce the ammonia levels in Northern Ireland. And at the minute, without that there, we are in a very unsatisfactory situation. And until that resol resolves, um, that uh, uncertainty still remains. So, you know, ultimately that there is what needs to be, you know, the, the outcome to move things on. Um, but no, we are uh, quite um, open and uh, willing to meet with people and, and have done that there throughout this process. Right, with individual agents from an individual farmer putting, uh, applying for planning permission. Yes. Um, now, ultimately, what we would normally uh, recommend, first and foremost, is that they contact the relevant planning authority because, you know, um, their first point of contact should be with them. But uh, we do uh, meet with them, speak to them, and provide advice on, a, you know, a regular basis. And your and your telephone number is readily available if they want to if they want to speak to you. Um, our, our numbers are available. Yes, they're online. They're okay. on that. Yeah, because I know there's been difficulties once or twice trying to get through. But I'm glad to hear 
that's been resolved. Uh, second thing is, um, it's a border area I represent, and you're talking about ammonia. One doesn't know which way the wind blows, and I mean physically the wind blows in relation to this 1% created, et cetera, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, the, yeah, the habitat regulations specifically apply to designated sites within Northern Ireland. So therefore, primarily we would be concerned about the, the designated sites which fall within our jurisdiction. But we are mindful that there are protected sites uh, within uh, the 7.5 kilometres in uh, the Republic. And where they are within that there, um, we would try to uh, make sure that uh, the appropriate assessment uh, considers that. But there's also a requirement uh, with planning applications to undertake environmental impact assessments. And the environmental impact assessments allow for transboundary issues to be taken into consideration, uh, more so than what the, the habitat regulations uh, do. The habitat regulations really just apply to the sites in Northern Ireland but if there are the wider concerns uh, with regard to transboundary issues, they should be picked up under the environmental impact regulations. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, we have John Morris and Darren. Okay, John. Sure, thank you. Can I thank Nicola and Paul as well for the information that we'll have here today and the opportunity to question. Some of what is going to raise has been covered, but I think I have to say that it looks to me that there are certainly issues with processes and... Uh, up to getting up to date protocols in relation to advice from NIEA. Uh, can I ask that uh, on the basis of the report that tells me that in 2020 there were 97 intensive agricultural related applications? Two things. Firstly, has there been an increase in relation to, uh, of those types of applications and has that led to? a subsequent increase in the amount of technical and detailed scientific advice that you have to provide and therefore impacting on resources. Yeah, Second, I think that... Secondly, sorry, Paul, but I'm going to tie both up together here. Um, have you identified any trend or any rate of increase in those applications over a period of years, like, for example, five years or ten years, that could substantiate that, that resource drain? Yeah, well... Um... Going back to the first question, which is also linked to the uh, the second question, there has been a, a significant increase in planning applications for uh, intensive uh, livestock, and that is directly linked to uh, the department's uh, going for growth um, strategy, which was all about increasing uh, the productivity and the, the number of uh, livestock uh, on farms in Northern Ireland. So that has... It is really where the the increase in the intensive uh, livestock planning applications can be directly uh, linked to that going for growth um, strategy. Um, and because of that, um, that is why uh, these issues such as ammonia have come to the fore. You know, back whenever that strategy was uh, uh, being, uh, you know, prepared uh, and uh, launched, Ammonia wasn't really in anybody's uh, radar at that time, but you know, and as uh, you know, environmental issues come to the light, or, or yeah. come to light. Well, then that in itself triggers more consultations, and from uh, the transfer of planning functions back in 2015, we have noticed an ongoing uh, increase in you know the number of consultations that we have been um, uh, receiving. Yeah. And these would be matters like an intensive um, pig farming, for example, in, in the Alderman Newton Abbey area, which has been one that you'll be aware of, set the headlines once or twice. Yeah, it's uh, poultry, uh, pig farming and uh, uh, cattle housing. You know, that there is where, where the, you know, the issues of ammonia are uh, uh, coming from and the applications. So. Okay, look, thanks for that. Okay, okay then, we have two more speakers. Uh, Morris? Morris? Yep, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicola and Paul. And Paul, it's good to see you again. Uh, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> year. I say that, that tongue-in-cheek. Uh, but uh, 
Chairman, I, I have major concerns over the level of ammonia on our land, uh, in our waterways and airborne. And what I perceive is a lack of progress in planning terms on new technologies which are being developed to separate fluids from solids and farms. I, I'm also concerned that there's a disparity between DERA's assessment of that shared and that of shared environmental services on the amount of ammonia on our land. Uh, that's right across Northern Ireland. And indeed the threat of destruction to habitats which, which uh, can take years to recover if at all. And some species and plants may never recover, may lost. So, Paul, you've highlighted ammonia levels in Northern Ireland in the high 90s and percentage terms. Is that not an alarm bell that requires urgent attention? It is. It is, and uh, there are reduction uh, targets, and the reduction targets have not been met either. So, you know, it is uh, an urgent matter, but I would have to emphasise that, uh, you know, the responsibility for ammonia levels and the impact of ammonia on the environment lies with DERA. You know, that there is not SES's role. SES's role is to ensure that development complies with the, the regulations. It's not to go out there and control ammonia. And that's for the ammonia strategy, which uh, DERA will be bringing forward, and hopefully they'll be consulting on shortly. That mm -hmm. is uh, the holistic approach of how Northern Ireland reduces you know, the ammonia levels in uh, the countryside. But you know, you know, the levels are very high. They're actually a lot higher in Northern Ireland than they are in either England, Scotland, Wales, or, or the Republic of Ireland. We have by far the highest uh, levels of ammonia. Mm -hmm. Just one quick one, Chair, with your permission. Yeah, just quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, very close down. Go yeah. ahead. Something you raised at the start of the meeting, and William highlighted, and probably Rosemary as well. Farmers are willing to change practices, but the Chairman has, has, has highlighted replacing old and outdated buildings and with them old and outdated methods. Is there not an onus to help those farms and farmers who want to evolve farming practices using new technologies to reduce ammonia at source? Is this due to a lack of clarity from NIA and a lack of uh, a, a, a good ammonia strategy in place? Yeah, yeah, I think that there, um, and that's where SAS would welcome, you know, advice from Dara on uh, new technologies and, uh, you know, what are the best uh, farm management practices to reduce ammonia. There is a lot that can be done, and hopefully that there, you know, we will move down that route, and that is how you know the issue will be addressed. Um, but at the minute, we're in a situation where about the ammonia strategy. Uh, still hasn't been uh, published or implemented, and we need that there to bring down the levels. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Nicola. Okay. Thanks, Chair. And last but not least, Claire. Thanks very much, Chair. <laughs> I know. <laughs> thanks. And thanks very much for being here with us today. I know we've been waiting quite a while to hear from you. So I'm glad that you're here. And just want to put on record as well that um, certainly from my um, end, any feedback or reports that I hear about SES and the advice that they give to councils and councillors is second to none, extremely professional, and that they know the business. Sorry, we've lost Claire. I've lost Claire. Philip, can you jump back to these things before Claire comes back in again? Because you were looking on as well. <laughs> Sorry, man. <about that. laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chair. B basically, mine is very, very quickly because uh, all of it's been answered. But uh, Paul said that obviously it's Deira that set the policy, and we're all awaiting the ammonia strategy and all to put this into place. But Nicola did, and uh, and her contribution say that you know, while they're awaiting that, they hope, and I can't remember the exact word she used, that the strategy is sensible, workable. It was a phrase like that uh, to take into account. Uh, the, the importance of the agri-food business. So, I mean, I was just going to ask Nicola, you know, in her view, what is that sensible strategy slash approach for the way forward? Well, as Paul alluded to, it is all about mitigations that you can put in place. So, you know, we are hopeful that the new ammonia strategy will will outline techniques, even incentivize farmers to be able to, you can't say there's a problem without you know, creating a solution. So if you're going to really move forward pragmatically and collaboratively, it's about working together to find those solutions. It's about education out in the farming community and making sure they are they are aware that it's an issue and this is what you need to do to mitigate that issue or this is what the techniques you can apply to your business to really, really drive it forward and bring those levels down. So that's what I mean by that is that, you know, just it's, 
it should be a collaborative approach. Okay. So okay. I suppose it's also about just you know, if there is going to be growth, it has to be sustainable growth, and we need a holistic approach to be able to do that. And at the minute, it, it is being done very much on a piecemeal basis, which is not satisfactory. Okay. You mind if I get Claire and we've, we've only got two minutes left and to get cut off there. Claire? Thanks very much, Chair. Sorry, I've lost the camera. I don't know what's going on. Apologies in my technology, but there's not, I'll fly through it. Sorry. Um, can I ask you, I know you've said that SES then are accountable to all the, count, the 11 councils, and that's who they um, give advice to. Who do they report to? I know that they get their funding from DFC. Um, they um, work within um, DFI's planning, and um, they're upheld by uh, DERA and any NIEA's policies under the HRAs. Who did they report to? Claire, they report to Mid East Antrim Bar Council. So they sit within the development directorate, so they're accountable effectively to directly to Mid East Antrim Bar Council. But they also, I suppose, are under that. They're like a shared service across 11 councils. But ultimate responsibility sits with Mid East Antrim Bar Council at the minute. Okay, so do you get reports from SES then? Yes, we would get reports regularly. I suppose Paul manages the staff, and then I meet with Paul, and he would regularly feed back on progress, applications, finance. You know all the all the variables that would be there to, to manage the service. Okay, so how long have you been aware that our spas and sacks are breaching the HRAs, um, particularly um, in the money levels? I suppose it, it really came to light um, in, back in 2018, June 2018, uh, and it was uh, through a DERA stakeholder forum on ammonia, where about uh, DERA officials uh, done a, a PowerPoint presentation, and that was really when uh, we became aware that the ammonia levels were uh, as high as they were. Okay, and what action was taken then? Um, well, ultimately, um, Around the same time, there was a, a European uh, court ruling in, in the Netherlands for about uh, at that stage. Um, it uh, ruled that the uh, levels uh, which um, in the Netherlands, which they were uh, saying that were acceptable, uh, were no longer acceptable or were no longer compliant with the uh, regulations. and. Uh, and NAA here, uh, their levels were actually higher than that. So yeah. at that stage, we did have meetings with uh, NAA officials to discuss the problem and to discuss uh, the protocol. At that stage, there was no assembly in operation, and NAA said, look, we cannot uh, amend our uh, protocol in the absence of uh, you know, a, a minister and Ultimately, that eventually led to the internal guidance, which um, SES uh, published um, yep. to uh, show, because we ultimately had to demonstrate to councils or provide advice to councils that they were complying with uh, the habitat regulations. So can I ask you, in the situation where we know that Northern Ireland is in breach um, of, met, I think, is it 98% of our sex and spas are breaching um, the habitats regulations up to 400% year on year on year. Um, and this has been made aware and people have been well informed of the facts since 2018. I think the department's own figures are showing us that up to five to 600 people die prematurely um, in Northern Ireland um, that that can be linked to this problem every single year as well. See, in a situation where the Northern Ireland Environment Link is operating an ammonia protocol that they have openly admitted is not legally proofed, um, SES then are given their advice on planning applications. Are they taking into account the cumulative effect in an area or are they stringently focused on a planning application? And if that application goes ahead and exasperates the problem um, under habitat regulations, who is left open to risk there? Well, well with regard to the cumulative uh, impact, uh, that there will form part and parcel of the appropriate assessment which uh, SES uh, carry out on individual planning applications. Now, um, 
ultimately um, the responsibility rests with uh, DERA. You know, they're responsible for ammonia levels and, uh, and the impact that it has happened on the environment and public health. So that is where uh, you know, the responsibility for updating policy and for bringing forward the strategy lies with. Um, so ultimately, that's their remit. That's not SAS's remit. SAS's remit is solely to assess uh, planning applications under the uh, habitat regulations, and that there will include uh, you know, a, a cumulative uh, assessment. Okay, so just to be clear there. Um, we, we, we've lost broadcasting. We're no longer broadcasting, so this meeting is no longer in public session. Um, that means that anybody who gets kicked out again, we can't get back in, and the, the, the quality of the, the the transmissions will end. So um, we just need to, we need to finish literally now. Um, This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.